the hour of 1230 having arrived and the council having completed its business in closed session, city council is back in session and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Ethnewson? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Brunner? Present. Valentari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. The quorum having been established, we will move on to oral communications. This will be the opportunity for anyone who is with us either in council chambers today or online to make comments to the council regarding any item under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. If you're here to speak on an item on our agenda, you will be given the opportunity to do so when we get to that item. This is oral communication. Let me see if there's anyone with us in chambers today which wish it, who wishes to provide the council with oral communication. Seeing and hearing none, Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We do, yes. We will take the first person online, Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Yes, hi, Mayor. This is Barrett. In honor of Black History Month and Valentine's Day, I'd like to mention one of my personal Black History experiences in San Francisco in the third grade in 1963. It was Valentine's Day, and it was the custom that little boys gave little girls Valentine's in class. My mother insisted I give every little girl a Valentine's so as to not to hurt their feelings. And being a good boy, I mostly did so and tried to give one to a very quiet, very pretty black girl who had a mellow heart smile named Alicia. Now, Alicia had an insufferable, insufferable pigtail sidekick named Lorraine, who seemed to me to be a short, mean, possibly jealous, messed up hanger around, who stood between us and proceeded to tell me I should stay with my own kind of people to stay with my own kind, as she said. The civil rights movement was picking up steam, and I told her that kind of thing was going away. And anyway, she couldn't tell me that. Only Alicia could tell me that. The memory of all this is still seared in my mind to this day, as I was shocked when, even with that great kind smile, her silence showed she took Lorraine's side, and she would not take my Valentine card. That thing sidetracked what could have been the time of America's greatest progress toward a society of equal, free individuals judged by character and not by sin color since then. Among those was welfare and affirmative action that destroyed the black nuclear family, the ideas of cultural Marxism, progressive identity politics with DEI, critical race theory, radical BLM claims of police systemic racism. Now put forth the idea white people and our institutions are inherently racist and children are racist since birth. All need to be educated to believe this, that unequal wealth or success is always the result of racist oppression, not merit, talent, or hard work. And a different income is always in itself an injustice that violence is justified and white people and any white people will do should pay and people of color shown perpetual privilege and only a coerced lowest common denominator mediocrity of forced equal life outcome through an anti-american central authority using hypocritical discriminations of control can achieve the result is our once great cities are now cesspools of cultural marxist decay happy valentine's day thank you, thank you very much Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to the council meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ken Bear. I'm the president of SEIU 521 uh, here at the city of Santa Cruz. I am here today to address you uh, about the third round of class and compensation study uh, that may be affected, may not be affected by uh, a later uh, proposal. So. Um, we've come to an understanding with the city of Santa Cruz that <clears throat> when funds allow that uh, city workers get closer to proper compensation. Uh, and we are at the third round, uh, but we understand that uh, uh, HR and finance uh, are not going to be recommending that you proceed with that today. Uh, however, I'm asking you to consider to actually proceed with with continuing on that route. Uh, like I said, it's the third round. Um, the finance has projected a, a downturn in economic activity in 2025 as the basis for the reasoning. However, they were not able to explain that to me in a satisfactory manner. And I hope that you see that the Continuation, at least in the same rate of increase, is likely here in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, they actually projected a downturn. So less income coming in uh, for the stream of revenue in 2025 
than in 2024 or 2023. So that, that, that's my piece. Uh, we may be sticking around to listen to the rest and possibly address you some more. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council. It's Bradley Snyder. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the buildings and the apartments uh, that are going up now. One time I was in downtown uh, at Subway, and it was approaching noon. And uh, and it just so happened that I guess the, the, the lunch bell rang, and all of a sudden there was over 20, maybe 25 uh, construction workers behind me at Subway. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, so what that, what that, what, what that was like was, well, first of all, what I realized is, 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 is not a single one of these guys or anybody I, I knew from growing up here in Santa Cruz or had seen. And, you know, so part of, part of, I think, like I, I've said before, part of the, uh, the construction of some of these larger structures in, uh, downtown Santa Cruz, I feel it's an imported value. I feel it's, uh, people who are politicians who are not having, uh, you know, uh, seeing the community, uh, and grown up here and and seen it um, seen it develop uh, you know after the earthquake seen it develop in certain ways and I feel like uh, the development is just so uh, fast forward that it's it's to me I, I, I personally find it kind of offensive now uh, the impulse uh, to make more housing you know I, I feel like first of all what you're doing is you're warping the market rate for for any housing in Santa Cruz by putting all this high density housing in the center of everything um, you know, they've kind of marketed Santa Cruz. They said, okay, the locals are just these quirky kind of antique, you know, values, pro-drug, socially anti-conservative liberal liberals. Right. And, and, and then, uh, and, and really what you're, what's driving it are the UCSC students who have a two year average of living in the County. And, and they, and they, I, I personally almost feel like uh, UCSC should be to like be made like a separate administrative division with their own, you know, mayor, pardon the expression, but their own, you know, their own representative on council, and counsel something else. That would be a order again, which we just did. And it worked out great. We like you, Fred. Thanks. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome back to the council. Well, thank you so much. My name is James Ewing. The Board of Supervisors meeting was quite fun. Hmm. I got chastised and stopped for saying some adjectives that would be perfectly acceptable on national radio. Simply remind those gentlemen that I wish the sheriff would have been in the room because then I would have really spoke my mind. So what's going on in Santa Cruz? What, what, what about the loan from the Environmental Protection Agency Bank? I wonder where that stuff is. You know, about a year ago, they decided it was okay to burn off a half million gallons of chemicals that turned into dioxins that are dangerous at parts per billion. EPA's guidelines on that is only off by a factor of a 1,000. What other government agencies aren't off by a factor of a thousand? So it's just interesting. Timer, there it is. You know, it's just kind of fun to address the various people. Uh, I'm not that sure about what's on this agenda, but I'll be looking at it and speak pointedly. I must admit, I've watched the Putin interview three times. I still haven't taken notes. I don't know what I would give to have two hours with that man. Um, I have endured at least 20 full and partial other joke commentators, not as much of a joke as Tucker Carlson, but almost equal. I really like what Scott Ritter had to say in about six minutes, but boy, would I ever love to sit down with that man. I mean, I recommend if anybody wants some interesting information that could really be branched off. I mean, it's amazing what somebody who, who's had the world's best military and healing and growing food location for, oh, 1,200 years. Uh, it's really quite amazing what they'll choose to talk about and their sense of humor and their state of grace. I don't have that opportunity to be in a state of grace, but um, I'd like to be. Thank you. Anyone else online? No one with their hand raised. Thank you. Last call, if anyone would like to provide testimony under oral communication. Seen here, none. 
We are on item three, mayoral proclamations, and I am wondering if Ms. Collins-Hart Johnson might be kind enough to make a presentation regarding Leslie Connor. Thank you, Mayor. It's my great privilege to um, present this mayoral proclamation to Leslie Connor. As please come forward, and I'm gonna read parts of this um, and then share some additional thoughts. Um, so whereas in 2011, Leslie Connor began her tenure at Santa Cruz Community Health Centers when it was called Women's Health Center, and with Leslie Connor's leadership, the Santa Cruz Community Health Center was de designated as a federally qualified health center, and in the ensuing years focused on expanding sites and services and strengthening the finances, operations, compliance, and quality. And with Leslie's guidance, the health centers expanded the behavioral health program to include evidence-based treatment to address opioid and other substance use issues and developed responsive care and services for unhoused patients serving more than 2,000 individuals a year. With Leslie's guidance, the health centers advanced a vision of pediatric center of excellence using EBPs, particularly on, on those in early childhood to prevent and address adverse childhood experiences. And with Leslie's leadership, um, the Live Oak Health Center was brought forward in partnership with Dientes and Mid Penn Housing, and it's the first of its kind to unite health and housing on a centrally located campus, with the second being the City of Santa Cruz Metro Pacific Station North housing project due to break ground this month. Um, and with Leslie's leadership, um, she saw the health centers grow in workforce from 50 to over 200 employees and a budget of 5 million to over 30 million. Um, with Leslie's leadership, Santa Cruz Community Health Centers was a leader in pandemic response, providing outreach, education, and vac vaccines to underserved community members. Leslie has served as a strong advocate for justice for women's reproductive rights and led rallies as reproductive rights were being stripped away from women across the country. And with Leslie's Connor's support, a culture of collaboration across healthcare systems, partnering with health, health, school, and social service partners, and service of improving community health and well-being, and lead us, leading us to the vision of healthcare as a human right. So now, therefore, I, Shepard Kalantari Johnson, on behalf of our mayor, um, do hereby proclaim February 13th, 2024, as Leslie Connor Day in the city of Santa Cruz, and encourage all of you and all of us citizens to join me in this observance. more words I want to say um, about Leslie. I have had the privilege of working with Leslie for, I think, 18 years now, um, initially on the Health and Boomer Partnership when we are working on childhood obesity prevention. Um, but what I want to share about Leslie is that she enters every space with courage and with compassion because she sees the potential in our community. She sees the potential in every human being. And I have learned so much from you. You have done so much to change systems that aren't working, policies that aren't working, and we are a much better community for it. So thank you for all of your work, Leslie. Well, thank you very much, and I, I want to thank Shebra for the acknowledgement and the, the whole, all the city council members for the acknowledgement. Um, I think uh, I've been honored to serve in this role, and honestly, I couldn't do it without partnerships um, like we've had with the city of Santa Cruz and also with our amazing staff. We have some amazing people who work um, with me at the organization. Um, this is actually the Santa Cruz Community Health Center's 50th anniversary. Santa Cruz Women's Health Center was opened at that same location on Locust Street in 1974. This was a year after Roe v. Wade was passed. And we continue that mission of improving the health of our patients and community and advocating the feminist goals of social, political, and economic equality to this day. Um, again, our partnership with the city is vital. We're right a stone's throw away, and as you know, we're going to be partnering with the city on the expansion at Pacific Station. We're really excited about that. And I'll just let you know that Anita Aguirre <laughs> is, 
is our new CEO. She's fantastic, comes with tons of experience and knowledge. And so she will be working with you and the wonderful Bonnie Lipscomb in the, in the months ahead to build out that place. Um, and it's going to be beautiful again with housing and, and pediatrics and all of it. So again, thank you so much for your partnership and um, onward. Thank you. We are on presiding officer announcements. I have none. Statements of disqualifications. This would be the opportunity. Mr. Newsom. Mr. Kelly, thank you. I have to disqualify myself from uh, agenda item 18. I own property within 500 feet of this property. So noted. Any other statements of disqualification? Additions or deletions to the agenda? Do we have any? We have none. No. We have none. Moving on. We are on city attorney report on our closed session. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, the council met in closed session to discuss two items of pending litigation, Alicia Lopez versus Mary McCoy et al. and Don't Morph the War versus City of Santa Cruz. Uh, the council got an update and discussed these two items with legal counsel. The council also met in closed session to discuss five items of real property negotiation with its city negotiator, Body and Lipscomb. For the first three items invo uh, involving the addresses 1126 Pacific Avenue, 1016 Cedar Street, 1520 K2 Pacific Avenue, Council Member Bruner recused herself as she noted prior to closed session. And the whole council was present for the remaining two items involving the addresses 37 Municipal Wharf and 59 Municipal Wharf. Thank you. Thank you. Council meeting calendar. Madam Clerk, any updates or items you would like to draw to our attention? No updates, no. Thank you so much. We are on the consent agenda. If you're unfamiliar with how this works, we will be taking up items 5 through 14 on one motion. What I will do is give the council members opportunities to pull an item, comment on an item, or raise questions on the item. I will then extend that uh, courtesy to members of the public who are with us today. Let me start with the council. I'll start on my left, Ms. Bruner. Uh, comment on item number 9 and 12. Mm -hmm. Please proceed. Item number 9 is, uh, it is the city participation in countywide landlord incentive program a con contract amendment and budget adjustment through our economic development department. And I just wanted to um, really thank uh, our economic development team in housing and um, really thank um, the, the staff at the Housing Authority for partnering with us. This program has been um, a real um, benefit to our community and um, what this item does is it in uh, it's a proposed motion for funding to the landlord incentive program and um, which really makes sure that any housing choice voucher holders in our city will continue to have access to high quality affordable units citywide so thank you thank you uh, item number 12 that was the um or is let me go back. <clears throat> the unsignalized crossing improvement project notice of completion. And that was just a thank you. I've noticed um, some of those um, completed projects. And just another example of the small, many ways that our community is safer. And thank you. Thank you. Ms. Collins Johnson, Madam Vice Mayor. Ms. Watkins, Ms. Brown, Mr. Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. I uh, want to make a quick comment as well on item agenda item number uh, nine. Uh, uh, similar to my colleague, I want to thank uh, Director Lixcom and her team for bringing this, this uh, item forward. As my colleague said, uh, this program uh, works in partnership with the uh, Housing Authority uh, with the county to increase opportunity for low-income members of our community to. Um, obtain rental housing and I think this is a great uh, I think this is a great program and I hope to have further discussions during uh, budget hearings on how to uh, augment uh, this program thank you thank you on uh, item 8 
I would comment that uh, I understand how this is the uh, security deposit interest rate for residential rental properties. And having been the county treasurer and understanding how this number is arrived at, I understand it. I don't agree with it. Uh, and that is, I think it is significantly too low. Uh, as county treasurer, as I say, I, for 10 years, I've made recommendations on how to establish this. This is pretty common in government financing about how it is you, you come to this number. Uh, I would like, uh, this is not additional direction, I would simply like to point out to economic development and housing that I would like to engage in a conversation with you as we move along and as we prepare this for next year about what alternatives we might have because I think it's pretty clear that you can beat the heck out of this return uh, without really working very hard to do that. So uh, uh, I would like to engage in that conversation at a later date. Uh, I'll associate myself with, uh, with Mr. Newsom's comments on item nine. This would be the opportunity for anyone who's with us today who wishes to comment on an item on items five through 14 inclusive, you will have uh, two minutes to make your comment on any and all items you wish to comment on, but you get an entirety of two minutes. Good afternoon again. Yes, things keep changing. It's one of the pleasures of life as things change. So on item number seven, the mm -hmm. integrated regional water management, and then 15, the CalPERS, My understanding is there's going to be 5 million gallons of sewage being pumped into the mid-county water table. And you have that structure that's right next to the sheriff's building, which has a very interesting frequency weapon on top of the sheriff's building. And you have that new pedestrian bridge that goes on there. You know, it sure looks like that building next to the sheriff's location is a Soylent Green factory. There's enough Soylent Green factories all over the place. They seem to be burning down the real ones all over. The real food locations. So, you know, next to water we need, next to air, we need clean water. And I have spoken before about questioning the EPA. I wish I had 25 minutes to share some information about the Community Foundation Santa Cruz County, which started this program in 2007. Um, Probably enough on that. Moving to the CalPERS and what you guys are uh, putting all your nest eggs in. I really hope that that works out for you. I have some feelings that 2024, 2025 are, have quite a bit of information in them that the four major religions talk about. So it's going to be interesting how we all work together through these changes. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else who's with us today wish to comment on any item on the consent agenda? And we will have one more person online. Good afternoon, person online. <clears throat> Excuse me. Welcome to the council meeting. I just wanted to I just wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, the wisdom of a resolution, um, the, you know, uh, declaring a, an existence of a state of emergency. I mean, the storms are largely over and uh what i kind of find um, objectionable is the the term atmospheric river because people can drown in a in a river per se but in uh you know in a storm that comes along uh you know they will in in in, in addition to drowning in rivers they'll uh, they'll have all, all you know all uh, a panoply of other problems so uh, i object to the I object to the term atmospheric river i object to politicizing the weather um and 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 climate um but you know uh, that's not to say it's not a fascinating topic of discussion um but uh, yeah i find it i find it kind of uh, and then uh, i wanted to uh i wanted to uh um i actually wanted to uh second uh although i'm not a, a voting member of this body i wanted to uh, say that um uh the uh the one uh 
the one uh, item on the uh, the safety improvement uh, that uh, Ms. Bruner mentioned, I, I, I agree with her. That's good that there are safety improvements um, happening uh, all the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. All input having ceased, the matter is back before the council. Motion to approve the consent agenda would be in order. I'll move consent. Ms. Watkins moves. Vice Mayor seconds. Is there a debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Healy? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Uh, next up is the consent public hearing. These are items 15 through 17 inclusive on the agenda. If you wish to comment on these items, this would be the opportunity to do so, and we will also take comment uh, online. Let me first ask if council members wish to comment or pull either of these items. I'll start around on my left. All right, let me go to anyone who is online. Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? No hands are raised. No hands are raised. Anyone with us today wish to comment upon either of these? Seeing and hearing none, a motion would be in order. Ms. Contar Johnson moves the consent public hearing agenda as a second by Mr. Newsom. Is there further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item number 18. This is an appeal from the Planning Commission approval of the development proposal at 900 High Street in Santa Cruz. We will have a staff presentation. There are then uh, various other actions we'll take, which include uh, testimony from the appellant and the applicant, questions that you folks may have. We will begin with Ms. Whitehall. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council. Good afternoon, thank you. One moment, let me get this set up. Um, my name is Brittany Whitehill. Um, thank you and hello, council and members of the public. So the item for your consideration today is an appeal of the Planning Commission's approval of a 40-unit apartment building on 900 High Street. Um, I am very pleased to report that the appellants of the project have recently contacted staff indicating that their concerns have been addressed through revised conditions of approval. So will not be contesting the project. Um, so I do have a very brief presentation that I can share and have backup slides if there's any additional questions. But considering um, no concerns from the appellants, we'll keep it very brief. So as I mentioned, this project is at 900 High Street on the north side of High Street, immediately to the northeast of its intersection with Moore Avenue. Um, it's adjacent to Westlake Elementary. Other surrounding uses include single family homes, a church, um, a non-operational quarry, and UCSC UCSE campus housing. So the project proposes to construct a 40 unit, four story apartment complex on the, the uphill portion of the site, the northern portion of the site. Um, the site would also be subdivided to create two lots. So one existing lower lot, which will retain the existing church, and that'll be about three 3.7 acres, and then an upper lot of approximately 2.23 acres with the apartment complex. Um, the project is providing uh, its five low income and four very low income units, amounting to 22.5% of the total unit count. Therefore, it does qualify for density bonus, and as a reminder, it is um, subject to California Senate Bill 330 and not subject to the city's objective standards for multifamily development. The project was approved by the zoning administrator on October 4th and then appealed to the city council, or um, pardon, to the planning commission. The planning commission considered the project on November 30th um, and approved the project, and their approval was appealed by Norman Tardiff, representing the Spring Tree Homeowner Association and Westlake Neighborhood Association. So the appeal to the city council had sort of three primary areas of concern. Um, the first had to do with implementation of the geological recommendations. Um, the site has some unique geologic features, um, and as such, the applicant has been working with a geologist and geotechnical engineer. 
The appeal raised concerns that the conditions of approval didn't fully capture the recommendations of the geologist. Um, another point raised in the appeal was concerns about the proposed use of clustering density. So we looked at the entire 5.9 acre site to determine the development capacity and clustered that um, within the smaller two and a half acre portion of the site. Um, that has been resolved through the project being revised um, to take advantage of new amendments to state density bonus law. Um, so that's no longer a, a concern of the appellant. And then lastly, there was some concerns with potential future damage to heritage trees that are intended to be preserved. And um, we have some updated conditions to um, address those concerns as well. So to summarize, since Planning Commission approved this project, we have um, revised a number of the conditions of approval. Um, firstly, there was a condition for a deed restriction to memorialize that the clustering of density had occurred. Since clustering is no longer proposed, we have eliminated that condition. Um, we have refined the conditions related to the geological and geotechnical recommendations. So um, the project geologist and geotechnical engineer will both need to submit a letter indicating that they've reviewed the construction drawings prior to issuance of the building permit, and then a subsequent letter prior to occupancy that they've signed off on the project. Um, we have, at the applicant's uh, consent, added some additional more stringent tree protection conditions, and this is through collaboration with staff and the applicant. Um, so these protections would include um, periodic arborist inspections at different stages of construction and as needed. Um, the applicants have also agreed to a, an enhanced mitigation of um, for each heritage. If there were to be a heritage tree that requires removal due to changes in the project or um, failure to implement tree protection measures, um, they've agreed to a, a, an enhanced mitigation of either, so the typical city mitigation would be for each heritage tree removed, um, it'd be replaced with one 24 inch size tree or three 15 gallon trees. Um, so the condition now says it would be two 24 inch or four 15 gallons. So enhanced tree um, mitigation, some refinements to the, um, the condition related to the participation agreement for um, inclusionary housing and then some additional rewording and reordering for clarity. So that sort of sums up the, the revisions to the conditions. So in conclusion, staff is very pleased that the appellant's concerns have been addressed through the revised conditions of approval. Staff finds that the project is consistent with the city's general plan and meets all required development standards except as modified through density bonus waivers and concessions. Additionally, the project is aligned with several goals and policies of the newly adopted six cycle housing element and will contribute to the city's um, meeting its regional housing needs allocation, particularly through provision of very low income units. Um, staff continues to support the project as designed with the recommended conditions of approval included as exhibit A to the resolution. Therefore, staff recommends that the city council deny the appeal upholding the planning commissions Approval of the minor land division, design permit, slope development permit, density bonus request, and heritage tree removal permit based on the findings in the resolution and the conditions attached to that resolution. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see if there are any initial questions by council members. Let us move to, yes. Certainly, Ms. Watkins. I just have a procedural question. In regards to the appeal now being withdrawn, is the motion language remain as a denial of an appeal or would that shift? Yeah, so to clarify, the, the appeal, I, the appellant's intent is not to withdraw their appeal. I think um, what they're trying to convey is that they are satisfied with the current recommendation with the updated conditions of approval. Got it. So, so I they think it would be the, it would be the same language. OK, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. I was procedurally confused. I appreciate that. Thank you. Let us hear from Mr. Tardif, if Mr. Tardif is here. Mr. Tardif is the appellant. Mr. Tardif will have up to five, up to five minutes. We will now hear from Ms. Alfaro, who represents Workbench for up to five minutes. This would be the applicant. 
Mr. Simon, you don't even look a little bit like Ms. Alfaro. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm thinking about that for Halloween, but um, <laughs> no, I just wanted to introduce, I'm happy to take any questions, but I'm going to forgo telling you all my points about the project, um, but I want to have a chance to hear from the pastor of Peace United Church, uh, Pastor David Pate, because they're really the inspiration for why this project is happening and the guiding force and the mission of the project. Um, we are helping them as a partner execute that. Um, so I think this is still just a worthwhile to have a couple minutes to sure. hear um, from Pastor David. Very good. Pastor, good welcome. Welcome to you. Good afternoon. I don't know why anybody would think that clergy always have to have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Dave Patti, and I am pastor of Peace United Church of Christ, and I want to offer a brief word about what this project means to us and why our congregation has been working on it for so many years. We call it Peace Village, and it is a central feature of our vision for the future of our ministry in that place, which has been in Santa Cruz for more than 150 years and on that site at 900 High Street for more than 60 years, and we intend for at least another 60. Peace Village is much more than a housing development for us. It has long been a part of the mission of Peace UCC to be a place for the wider community. We offer our campus and facilities as an inviting place of generous welcome, a gathering place for creativity and common cause, a sanctuary for prayer and praise and the arts, for healing and service and recovery, for the marginalized, and very often for people who've had a hard time finding a place. I think many of you, for all sorts of reasons, have been on our campus. And that's because we want you there. And we want more people there. And we want housing to be a part of that. We hold a vision of our church as a beloved community of caring and sharing where persons are seen and respected and where diversity is celebrated as the gift of a loving God, not a barrier that we have to overcome, but an asset that enriches us. Peace Village is a part of that vision for the flourishing of our ministry on the High Street campus and beyond. It includes 40 units of new housing, nine of them income restricted, low and very low, but even more than that, uh, accessible by clever design. We have two large units of co-housing. Uh, so really, accessibility is 50% is <laughs> of what we're doing in Peace Village. But it's most exciting as a vision of our future, a place to live and learn and play and grow with the church at the heart of it all. We are so glad to get to this moment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me, uh, this would be the moment for us to uh, ask any additional questions that council members may have, then I'm going to open it to public comment. The matter will then be back before the body. Do we have any other additional comments? Let me open this up to public comment. Anyone who wishes to make comment on this item, this would be your opportunity to do so, and you can speak up till two minutes in time. Anyone with us wish to do that? And while Mr. Hall is making his way here, do we have anyone online? No one with their hand raised. No one with their hand raised. Mr. Hall, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is John Hall. Uh, I have worked on this project along with other people in the congregation for now nine years. Uh, <laughs> we have, uh, and uh, one of our members of our uh, person who really helped to bring this forward in the early years is now deceased, but uh, Mary Mayo, uh, we do this in honor of her. And I want to thank uh, the planning department, uh, planner that we worked with, uh, Brittany Whitehill, uh, the Zoning Administrator, uh, the Planning Commission, and uh, 
the mayor and city council. Uh, you've all uh, been very generous with your time mm -hmm. and uh, consulted with us about uh, how to do this and uh, helped us make revisions in it. And I want to thank the appellants as well as neighbors who have raised issues that, uh, frankly, uh, have improved the, the project. Uh, one of the great benefits of the project as it's now designed is that it will improve the traffic situation at High Street and Moore Street. We think that's a great benefit to, to Westlake School. So I just sincerely want to thank uh, all of you that have been involved. And uh, as uh, Reverend Patti said, we are uh, so thrilled to be able to move ahead with this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hello, my name is Lola Quiroga. I'm a UCSA student representing the Student Housing Coalition. Um, I urge you to deny the appeal of the Peace Village. It's been appealed twice times, too, two times too many. Um, I think we desperately need student housing, housing for anyone. It's the co-living units are awesome, great way to build community. The affordable units are great, 22% is also awesome. Um, I would have loved to live here, to live at the Peace Village um, project. I would love to live there when it's built, hopefully, fingers crossed, come on. Um, <laughs> and yeah, uh, I urge you to deny the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Lisa Hazing, a member of Peace, and I just want to reiterate what has already been said. I'm not as eloquent as some of the people before me, but this is, I'm the moderator, so a bit of this approval is on my watch, and I'm really grateful. So thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone online with their hands up? Nope. Last call if anyone would like to testify on this item. Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the council. I would entertain a motion. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll move that the council adopt the resolution denying the appeal of Norman Tardif uh, and, uh, and thereby upholding the Planning Commission's acknowledgement of the environmental determination and approval of the minor land division design permit, slope development permit, density bonus request, and heritage tree removal permit based on the findings um, listed in the documentation and the conditions of approval. Um, I believe it's a re revised attachment. I want to make sure I get this right. So the the attachment has not been revised. The attachment so on, on with basis okay. is the correct. Got it. Conditions. Okay. So with the um, uh, uh, the conditions of approval as uh, seen in Exhibit A. Second by Ms. Contar Johnson. Ms. Brown, you may open on your motion. Thank you. I will very quickly say that I am just so thrilled for this project to um, be moving forward. I remember the first meeting I had back in 2017 when I first got on the council, um, and uh, you all have been tenacious. The alacrity you've demonstrated in getting to this point, your commitment to providing uh, the type of housing we really need in our community to making it affordable, um, that's the kind of community I want to live in. I so look forward to this project. Um, just thank you for, for persisting. Thank you. Ms. Contar Johnson is recognized. Let's just keep it brief. I want to thank um, all the groups and all the community members that came together. I mean, this is what we can accomplish when we do that, when we truly partner, is come up with a beautiful project that's going to serve our community. So thank you for all the hard work, and um, thank you to the city staff. Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom is disqualified. Councilmember Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Congratulations. We are on item 19. We will start with 19.1. These are 2024 budget adjustments and information on the city's financial status. Ms. Cabell will be presenting on this item. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Elizabeth Cabell, finance director.
So I'm here today with um, Sarah DeLeon, our people officer, as well as the budget team, Tracy Cole and Emily Burton, to present the uh, mid-year report for 2024. And in doing that, we're going to start by looking back a little bit, look at 22, 23, 24, kind of look at where we are right now, and then look um, at the adjustments that we have to bring forward for 24, and then also look into 25 and a little bit on the, um, the compensation study that we started in tw the 2021 compensation study that, um, that we've been working on. And then conclude with a recommended action. So looking back over the last couple of years, in fiscal year 22, we had a huge surplus, which was due to a lot of the one-time money that we received from ARPA and the California 14. Um, fiscal year 23, we actually had a little bit of a deficit. We ended the year about one and a half million, with about a one and a half million dollar deficit. We did, when we adopted the budget, we had a much larger deficit. It's about four million that we expected to pull from fund balance, so we came in better than what we had initially budgeted, but still a deficit for 23. In 24, we are showing the budgeted numbers up there, and that is we did adopt a basically a balanced budget, um, and that was primarily due to the postponing or not doing the um, CIP transfer. We usually do a $5 million transfer to our, for our CIP program. We did not do that and, and budget that in 24, which allowed us to, um, make, to present a balanced budget of $139 million. So kind of a little snapshot of where we are now. This is basically as of the end of the calendar year, so December 31st. And, you know, as I've mentioned before, things because of timing don't all, you know, it doesn't all hit at the exact time that we would like. So, um, so we, this is pretty much where we would expect to be about almost at 50% of revenue and a little over 50% for our expenditures. That's pretty much exactly where we expect to be. So we are tracking. Um, there will be, you know, there's a lot that comes in, especially the, the end of the year. We've got the um, sales tax and everything that runs a couple of months late. So, so anyway, I think in short, we're looking good for an expect where we expect to be for 24. Then um, this is looking at some of our top taxes that we receive. We see, receive lots of different types of revenue. We have charges for services, we have grants, we have various things. But these are the top taxes that we receive. And we're looking back four years here. So going back to 21, 22, and 23, you can see it's pre been pretty much a steady increase. We had a big jump in sales tax in 23 or 22 basically kind of that quick recovery from the pandemic, and then it sort of is back to where we would expect it to be, just sort of tracking um, as um, like the other tax revenues that we have. When looking at the mid-year report, um, we there's a lot of different adjustments that are going on. There's a lot of numbers in there, but basically most of it is all corrections, and some of these I've just highlighted here a couple of the corrections that we have. We have some revenues that were um, budgeted sort of too soon and for, for water, some grant revenues that were budgeted, that so we've backed those out. We've got some project corrections, which is basically no change to anything. It's just moving or moving revenue from a general ledger account into a project. And then we have a tech surcharge that we just started collecting this year, and we're moving that into its own fund. On the expenditure side, again, kind of moving things around, we are um, taking some money that we've already collected. We've got $2 million that we've been setting aside every year. For, um, for the ERP system, so we're now moving that into a project. And then we have 2.3 million that we've put in there for the purchase of a building um, over by the, which came to council a couple times ago, um, for the purchase of a building over on Locust. And could you go back one slide? I wanna enhance a little, <laughs> explain a little bit more here. So I do wanna talk a little bit about um, some of the assumptions that we have when we're looking at these revenues. We did do, you know, we presented a long range financial plan to you back in November. And in looking at trying to project what's going to happen 24, 25 and so on, we do look at a lot of different things. There's the trends, we look at, we've got information from the county, we've got information from consultants or HDL. So we have lots of different things that we look at. Specifically for property tax, we do build in 80 new residential units each year, 
and we start with a value of about a little over about 570,000, increase that about 3% a year. So we do build in some new construction there. We also do build in um, the some additional con um, commercial as well. So we do have those things built in that we are speculating, these things that we expect to happen. Nothing specifically tied to some of the development that we're doing here, but we do expect once those things are finalized and we know exactly what how to what kind of revenue to generate from that we do expect we can adjust our uh, model to reflect some of that increased revenue yeah and i'm going to cover the people aspect of the mid-year adjustment these next two slides um, the first slide here actually relates to funding and new positions being added to our public works and water departments, the classifications you see there. All of them relate to legislative compliance, improved service delivery, and CIP support. Um, next slide. Thanks, Bonnie. The second page is, has no funding associated with it, but this is a modification to our classification and comp plan that adds two new classifications, two supervisory positions for police records, and property evidence, and then an administrative correction that will improve some efficiencies for benefits and payroll. Um, no changes there, no changes to the staff itself or funding. Okay, so bringing up this um, kind of, we've talked a little bit about 24, 23, the past, now we're looking a little bit at the future. We've just started the budget process, and in looking, this graph probably looks familiar. This was presented back in November when we had we presented the long-range financial plan. We do expect expenditures to continue to outpace revenues. One thing that is probably not immediately clear on this chart is that when we're looking at, and you can see kind of the deficit decreases as we go through 25, 6, 7, and 8, that's because it's factoring in the use of our reserves in order to kind of get us closer to that balance. That's why, so it's looking like we have, you know, that revenues or expenditures may be increasing or decreasing. It's what's really happening and the reason you've got that change there and the decrease in the deficit is because we're using reserves. So the, uh, the, if, this, if we continue kind of along the trajectory that we're going, um, what happens is our operating and our emergency reserves are depleted by 27. Our pension reserve, which is a restricted reserve, can only be used for pension costs would be depleted by fiscal year 28. We also build in recession, so we have built in a mild recession that starts in 26, 25, 25, um, and then we kind of have that recovery. Basically, a seven-year recession is kind of what, I mean, a seven-year, we have a recession every seven years. So as part of that, also that increase is the recovery from the projected recession. So that's a little bit about what's going on as far as the, the chart. So it's not strictly reflecting only revenue generated and expenses. It's also reflecting the transfers that we have from reserves and reflecting that if we continue like that, then we don't have any more reserve. So as far as trying to um, get closer to, to um, this close this deficit, we are working with the Revenue and Ad Hoc Committee. We've got lots of the long range financial plan gave us lots of different options. We're still focused on we've got a cost recovery study that's going on. We have the sales tax ballot measure that's coming up in March. And part of this, too, like I mentioned, we did postpone that $5 million transfer to the CIP. CIP is still a priority for us. So we want that is going to be back in the budget for fiscal year 25 and moving forward. So we do want to make sure that we plan for that. And that is reflected in all of these numbers. So I mentioned a little bit about reserves. So I did want to talk about kind of where those, what, what that is and what kind of reserves that we do have. So at the, I have a, the slide up here shows the 22 and 23. The purple is sort of sitting out there on the side because that is a restricted reserve. That is our pension reserve. We can only use that for pension costs. So our goal is to have two months operating expenditures in, a, in an unrestricted reserve. So that's reflected by the line at the top. That is our goal to have unrestricted reserves at that Amount. And you can see even where we are right now, we have about 5.3 in 22, 6.2 in 23 at the end of 23 in our operating reserve, which we, which we try to keep at about 5% of our operating budget. And then we have an emergency reserve that kind of has stayed pretty static um, at 7.1 million. But those are the reserves I was referring to on the previous slide that we would deplete 
all of those, both operating emergency and pension reserve would be depleted by 28 without additional sources of revenue or without additional solutions to solve that deficit. So just again, a quick highlight into 25. We have started the 25 budget process. The plan right now is we will have budget hearings on May 28th and 29th, and then adopt the budget on June 11th. I'm back again. So if you can all take a rewind with me back to September of 2023. Um, you may recall some approval we received from council that adjusted compensation for several classifications in our service and supervisory unions. At that time, I also stated that I would be back with what was called a phase three analysis for our 2021 compensation study. So next slide, Bonnie. Here I am. I'm going to give you a slight overview of what I'm going to go through related to the analysis. That's the effort, the why of the importance of the analysis, the analysis itself and then the recommendation associated with this specific topic. Next slide, Bonnie. So our efforts in the why, um, I don't need to remind you all of our strategic plan, thriving organization that's in the center of the heart for human resources. Compensation is important, of course, to all employees. We also have an upcoming 2024 compensation study that we have a lot of preparation and analysis to do, and this analysis supports our efforts in that arena as well. Then there's also our all in shaping our future, which relates to projects that we feel there's opportunity for service delivery improvements. We have two of those, culture as a competitive advantage, as well as the 2024 compensation study that all support and relate to the analysis necessary here um, for phase three. Next slide. The analysis itself, we focused on our benchmarked classifications in the study. As you might recall, those are items that are, had surveyed agency comparisons. We looked at all the remaining benchmarks that are more than 10 percent, excuse me, more than 10 percent below market. We also looked at their associated mapped positions. There's usually a relationship between benchmarked and mapped, and that there's a similarity in the classifications knowledge, skills, and abilities, experience, education, et cetera. We took the analysis a step further and looked at unmapped or related classifications. So if they were close in salary range, we started to pay band other classifications that may not have been included as a benchmark or mapped position in 2021, 2018, or our 2015 study. So those are the three sets of classes that we looked at to collect what the cost could be to bring them within 10% of the market. Next slide, Bonnie. So this first set here shows you the benchmarked classifications. I won't read all of them off to you, but you can see some of our highest outside of market include our development manager at minus 20.4%. And I believe we have one at 22, our buyer one and two. Um, next slide, Bonnie. Our mapped positions in the gray, you see the original ben benchmarked classifications and their associated mapped items next to it. And so because of the definition of mapping in our study, we should also include these other classifications that are very closely related to the benchmarks. So these classifications were also included in the analysis. Next slide, Bonnie. These unmapped but related classifications, this is attachment one of the staff report for 19.2. There's about 42 separate classifications without showing you a long list. I tried to separate it by the type of work um, that's related to those 42 classifications here. Next slide, Bonnie. In total, if we're looking at fiscal year 24, 25, it's around, you know, in between $800,000. We tried to include the COLA averages to the, to the areas, to the years we have. Um, given the amount and the financial status so far, the recommendation at this point is that I submit this as a decision package with fiscal year 25 so that the council can see everything collectively and make a decision um, based on fiscal status and your approval in fiscal year 25. I'm available for questions. Yeah. We're available for questions. So if, if the recommended action is to adopt the resolution adopt with the 24 budget appropriation, authorize the city manager to allocate the budgetary changes, and adopt a resolution amending the classification and compensation plans. Thank you, Ms. Leon. Thank you, Ms. Cabell. 
we will now take questions. I'm going to start over on my right this time. We'll move across the dais. Then members of the public, you'll have your opportunity. Then the matter will be back before the body. Ms. Brown. Uh, thank, thank you, Mayor. Certainly. Uh, I wanted to try to get a better understanding of what the what it means to be delaying, or if we are delaying uh, making adjustments on the compensation based on the compensation study um, and those positions out of range. Uh, that was a major part of our agreement to settle our last contract, which, as we know, was um, a, a tough one, and. So I'm I'm wondering what this means. Are we we're we're delaying implementation of additional adjustments for what amount of time? Um, can I, I just want to better understand where this was supposed to come? I don't have that timeline in my head. So information is essential, right, to the cost. And I think at the time when we came in September, we had no idea of of what an estimate would be. And so at this point, the budgetary process is the recommended place for everything to go because I imagine there's going to be a number of other requests coming to you all for consideration at that time. Um, the knowledge and having that on the forefront and with the public, with our unions, is what was critical to me so that I can submit the decision package as needed based on union conversations. It is in our contract. It's a good faith effort. Um, and we have been continuously making that effort towards this goal. And I think fiscal year 25 is the most responsible aspect um, for that to come forward finally. Can I ask a follow-up? I, I appreciate that and um, am, am not in any way with my question suggesting yeah. that you're um, and that you're not uh, being completely reasonable <laughs> about what what is is you know where we're what we're where we're at. Um, but I do want to ask the question because I, I feel that you know I have some concerns about um, what happens when we push those decisions to our budget, you know, our overall budget, and then it, as you said, ends up on a list with a bunch of other priorities, and we have made it, at least I, that's what I believed I was doing when I voted to support that, um, that contract, uh, that we were committed to making this a priority, not, um, and that this would this would just move, right, um, as we were able to do it. So if we're waiting to then hear um, what it's competing against, I'm very concerned that we're not going to get, we're not going to make the progress that we um, said we wanted to make um, and that the, the members, uh, the workers of the city, believe that we were, um, we, in good faith, we're going to do that. So I'd, I'd like to, I guess we'll probably hear from members of the um, public and, uh, you know, I may have other questions. Thanks. Vice Mayor is recognized. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I do have some questions around um, increased health care costs. I've heard about this in other industries. Are we seeing that also as, as we're looking at total compensation packages? We are, we're, and that's reflected in the 25 budget. So as you move forward, we, that we have reflected increased insurance costs, health care, as well as other insurance, liability, and so on. So yes, those are, we are, we're expecting that, and that's what we've reflected, the information that we have now, we do have, we have reflected that in the 25 budget. Okay, and then um, as we're trying to, 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 you know, reconcile some of the gaps between the, the, the folks here and other neighboring agencies, is there a time, I know we've got some revenue streams we're hoping will come in, but is there a time we're going to have to look at potential cuts? Is that going to come at budget hearings also? I mean, cuts to departments or cuts on, in services? Um, well, does I that think, make sense? So right now we same are... same level of service. So, so right now when we're looking at um, especially 25 budget, um, we're looking at things kind of staying as they are right now. We don't, we're not projecting, you know, large revenue streams coming in or anything. We're not including the sales tax in there. So we're, we're projecting very conservatively. So the hope is with the work that we've been doing with the ad hoc committee, with the other things that we have going, that yes, once we, as we get further, you know, we're still a while away from 25 starting, that we'll have additional revenue streams. But that, but yes, we're looking at all, um, sources and all kinds of solutions if we if we do get to that point. So right now, again, we're be kind of being on the ultra-conservative side. We don't have anything 
large projected as new revenue, but as we get those, as new hotels come online, as things like that happen, we do reflect that. Thank you. I appreciate the con being conservative, but I also just want to acknowledge, like, even when we went to go out for a city manager, it was hard for us to find somebody because our city, previous city manager didn't take some raises. And so when we get these big gaps, um, it's harder to bring it back up. And so I think when looking at, at um, you know, various positions, the ones with the biggest gaps, I think it's important to address some of those um, and the positions that are the hardest to fill throughout the organization. And I'm not sure what those are, but I think that's important. And then bringing people up to you know a living wage whenever possible too. And if I may add to Elizabeth's comments, uh, Vice Mayor Golder, I just want to emphasize our commitment to retaining and attracting uh, top standard uh, employees. We, we benefit from excellent, hardworking, passionate public servants. Uh, and of course, compensation is an important aspect of that. We've made some good progress over the course of the last year with the last round of MOUs, as well as, as Sarah described, implementation of phase one and phase two. And I think we've got a good picture now of what phase th three will require. Of course, with some big question marks on the horizon as to whether or not the sales tax measure will be successful. We're all optimistic that the community will support that. Uh, but as we build out fiscal year 25, we'll have a better sense of where that's pacing and when we'll be in a position to move forward with it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Ms. Contar Johnson. Council Member Bruner is recognized. Can you um, clarify when you refer to um, the recommendation to um, pause or for the 2025 budget, do you mean the 2024 fiscal year 25 budget so starting in July? I, I'm not clear on that. Yes, so we're, what we're recommending is that that be brought as a decision package for the fiscal year that starts July 1 of 24, ends June Instead 25. Instead of starting now. Right. Okay. And if I may add to that real quickly as well, uh, Council Member Bruner, uh, the vast majority of the proposals that are here before you as part of the mid-year, really what I would describe as cleanup items, uh, much smaller in magnitude of what we're talking about as part of the phase three implementation. And from a practical standpoint, we'll be building out the next fiscal year budget over the matter of the next couple of months. So we're really already moving into budget development season. And that will allow us to, to really take a comprehensive look at this decision package along with you know, other needs that we're going to have to balance as we build out the budget. I think for me, my, my question stems from um, I don't want to lose what we, the work we've continued in the direction that we've given. And um, I think we need to show that by um, investing in our, in our workforce. And to pause is really doesn't show that. And it's a few months, um, so I'm. I will listen to public comment and um, understand how we can move forward. Thank you. For the questions, comments. I just have one Certainly, Ms. Watkins is recognized. I've um, over the years I've seen sort of that Im imminent cliff essentially, and it seems now as I'm finishing up my my last year on council, it's closer. And I'm just wondering how concerned you are about, you know, the fiscal year 2027, 2028, showing that you, or the graph that you showed. Um, I think that is concerning. It's been kind of on the horizon, and now it's sort of at the doorstep. And I, I just, I, I know that the Revenue Committee is working on, on that, but I don't know if you guys want to speak to that now or that's a budget hearing. Discussion. I mean, for, yes, it's concerning. I think that, but the positive part about it is that we're looking at it now. We are planning ahead. And I think that we, ha we have, you know, do that was one of the main reasons we did the long range financial plan. Like there's, it's not always about cutting expenditures. It's about the rev, it's both sides of the equation. And I think we've done a good job of identifying a lot of those things that we can hopefully make happen. And now the next step is to move forward and kind of get some of those things going so that we don't have that, you know, we're not just going to sit still, and we don't want to definitely have that cliff in 27 and 28. And how about the depleting reserves as well? Yeah, what I would add to that is uh, that updated 10-year forecast makes clear that we cannot simply rely on our reserves um, to fix this structural deficit. And we were fortunate through COVID to have a lot of one-time state and federal dollars that allowed us to survive that season. But we're once again looking at um, a forecast that shows that without major intervention, we will have completely depleted our reserves by fiscal year 27. 
that's obviously not acceptable. So the sales tax measure will be one option. We're gonna to have to continue exploring others. And then through this all in shaping our future opportunity, how can we continue to modernize a, as an organization, perhaps deliver services in a more efficient way, and really looking at both sides of, of the ledger to get our get ourselves on more solid ground. Okay. And just, you know, one more thing to add, because you know, we have had a lot of disasters, they seem to keep coming, and those are those can be very expensive. And a lot of that is the timing of it it takes for us. You know, we've got to go out and fix things and repair things and do things, but the money coming in from FEMA or wherever doesn't. So we have, we do, um, we brought a contract for a, a municipal advisor back in the fall. So we are working on trying to, again to kind of figure out what are some ways that we can help bridge that gap, knowing, you know, because we've got that, you know, money goes out way before it comes in. So we are looking at lots of different avenues as far as how to, um, to, again, to close that gap and not use up our reserves. That's definitely not what we want to, we don't want to be in that position. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Driller, a couple of questions. First of all, uh, Ms. Bruner, could I borrow that document? <laughs> Thank you. Um, for those of you who have not seen this document, uh, which is entitled Making Funds Make Sense, the finance department has developed this document. I commend it to anyone who is interested in local government finance and local government budgeting. This is a thorough but not dumbed down version uh, of how this little government works, and I strongly commend this document. Let me ask a couple of questions. Uh, what uh, Are we making any assumption with regard to uh, our shelter operations so far in the budget instructions to the departments? Are you making any assumptions with regard to our ability to get a soft landing, a nice long landing strip from the state of California for our current shelter expenditures, which are being subsidized by the state of California, but will end on July the 1st? So we have not made any, so we have our homelessness response budget continuing as it is in 24 on. What we don't have is the other side of that equation. We don't, you know, the one-time funding, as you mentioned, will be used up in 24. But we have not, our budget, our current budget does reflect continuing those services. Okay. So for absolute clarity purposes, the expenditure is in, you are assuming the expenditure from the city without support from others. Exactly. Okay, thank you. That's what I thought you were doing. Very good. A couple of others. Uh, parks and Recreation, um, the staff is going to rue the day that they got me to actually use the word midtown. Um, so now I'm willing to accept there is such a place and that I live in it. Uh, the, uh, the question I have is, is essentially, and, and this will be, this is more of an alert to, to the Parks and Recreation Department. I'm interested in understanding when we get to budget hearings, how the allocation of time resources in the Parks Department is made throughout the city. Um, not wishing to uh, get crosswise with my colleagues who represent the, uh, the ever popular west side of Santa Cruz, um, I will say that my eyes tell me that some of the pathways on the west side seem to be in much better condition and shape and maintenance and investment maybe than some others uh, in other parts of the city known as Midtown. So uh, I'm interested when we get to budget hearings to understand how you treat that. Uh, because it looks like some, and this is not an aspersion, it's a question, that some get maintained quite well and are up to some very high level, others maybe not so much. So I wanna see how we do that, not at the expense of the nice work that is being done. I understand it's challenging, but I will want to address that issue. Forewarned is forearmed. Uh, let me do a couple more. We have a, this is to the city manager. We have been discussing with the county and with others, a navigation center. I'm wondering if you could give us a moment of your thoughts on that now and 
uh, what we should be prepared for when we get to budget hearings. Sure, thanks for the question, Mayor. So we have stood up a multi-agency project team uh, that includes uh, community stakeholders like Housing Matters as well as our colleagues with the county with the goal of uh, really fleshing out and developing uh, a plan for standing up a permanent navigation center with permanent support of housing and shelter on the Coral Street campus. Our hope is uh, to align that with state funding uh, that may be available to help finance such a project. So that work is just now underway and to the extent uh, it has relevance to the budget, we'll be bringing that forward for further consideration. Thank you. Uh, I will say that on that point, uh, one of the reasons that we're going hand in hat in hand to our senator and assembly member right now with regard to shelter is because the state falls in love and out of love with various ideas on various challenges all the time. And homeless is no different. They used to be in love with shelter. They're no longer in love with shelter. They're in love with upstream prevention and permanent supportive housing leaving us with the gap in between on shelter, uh, which should it not be at the level it is now on a going forward basis, we will have lost years of progress on homeless, uh, effectively dealing with homelessness in this city. So I am pleased to hear that and more on that as we move along, I suspect. Another uh, heads up, when we get to budget hearings, I am going to be interested in hearing uh, how the uh, electric bikes, the uh, is, is the B-cycle program is working out, getting some data on that. One of the issues I'm interested in there is that we are, and I think correctly from a public policy point of view, at least initially, that it is a good idea to take some parking spaces out and put in these bicycles that you can rent and, and, and they make a lot of good sense and they reduce emissions and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, I do think that given we're sort of 1.5 laps around the track on that, it would be good, good to hear uh, how, we're, how we're doing on that. My last, uh, uh, my almost last item is, uh, is on the wharf. Uh, Mr. City Manager, we sustained some more damage uh, in the most recent storm, uh, shut down the end of the wharf as I understand it. Can you give us a bit of an update on the wharf and what we might be dealing with with regard to the budget? Sure, thank you for that question, Mayor. Uh, over the course of our last two storm systems, the wharf has unfortunately sustained uh, some major damage in, in two separate areas. Um, some of those are very visible because the wharf itself is sagging due to a loss of supportive piers below it. Um, so I know that our, our parks team has been working out um, a repair schedule for those areas. We also have uh, funding that's already been set aside um, to address a number of the structural and maintenance uh, projects that are needed on the wharf. As we get a better sense of what the budget looks like for those repairs and what Federal funding might be available to help support those. Uh, we'll be bringing those updates back to the council. Thank you. Uh, I, I do have a question. My last one is on uh, a desire to engage in conversation, not here and now, but between here and well before the cement hardens up on the budget. Uh, and that has to do with the uh, disc golf course. Uh, as I understand it, uh, ball golf versus disc golf, uh, that uh, they both take place more or less at the same place. And we have a golf course, ball golf course, and a disc golf course. As I understand it, the disc golf course that we have is considered among those who know such things that this is a disc golf course that people travel to. It's a destination. and not being a disc golfer uh, and a really terrible ball golfer. Um, I, I don't know much about this, but I'm told by people who seem to know something about it that that's true. And as I also understand it, there's a desire to engage you, sir. Come on, come on forward. <laughs> to engage. Mr. Elliott, please, please. Uh, thank you so much for all the work that you and your team do. It's absolutely remarkable. Uh, what I would like to do sometime between now and 
maybe a couple of weeks, three weeks, something like that before, as I say, things firm up too much. Let's engage in a conversation around the disc golf course, uh, what they bring to us, what their needs may be, looking at them over time, and so on. If we could do a little bit of work on that, that would be great. If you have a comment now, I'd be love to hear it. Yeah, happy to talk through that. Happy to get out to the disc golf course or the golf course anytime as well and do some yeah. tours and field trips, but uh, we'll follow up on that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I have no further questions. Anyone who's with us wish to comment on this item? We have anyone online, Ms. Bush, who wishes to comment on this item? Okay. Thank you. The uh, Bear with me for one second. We do have items on this, uh, three items that are recommended. The matter is back before the body. Is there a motion t on the recommendations? I'll move. I'll move the There's a motion by Ms. Watkins. Is our second? Second by Mr. Newsom. I, yes? I think sorry. you might have people in the audience here who want to speak, it looks like. Oh, I'm sorry. I did ask for that, but please come forward. No, no, no. It's quite all, it's quite all right. I was moving rather fast. Good afternoon. Uh, all again, right. Sir. So I got just a couple minutes left before I have to get back to work from lunch. So I would like you to consider to uh, move forward the the uh, class and comp study uh, adjustment, the third phase. Now, rather than waiting until budget year 2425, uh, because it affects our workers directly. Uh, this. Just for this morning, uh, the CPI was upgraded to 3.1% for January. Uh, we're talking about, for most of our employees that are affected by this, a 2% increase. It would go a long way in order to actually get them to that 10% as well as help them out in their everyday life. Um, Ms. Golder, since you had asked the question about uh, uh, insurance costs, uh, I'm sure that you would expect that other um, municipalities would actually have the same increase as we would. So in the next class and comp study in 2025, I would imagine that would remain equal. So we would still be 10% behind if, if everything else didn't change as well. So I, I would appreciate uh, that and I need to go back to work. So thank you very much. Speaking of your work, thank you for that. and. Thanks to all of your colleagues for the great work that they do. We are a service uh, government, and you are the service that is provided. And thank you so very much for that, and thank you for being here today, sir. Well, thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment on this item? Matter is back before the body. I do have one person who just. There's someone online. We'll take the person online. Good afternoon. Yeah, sure. This is Garrett. Hey, why not comment? Uh, you know, just in general, uh, I don't really, uh, well, I disagree with a lot of things, but I don't personally agree with compensation studies that compare, you know, your salaries and things to other government salaries. Just theoretically for me, uh, the only comparison is to a similar job in the private sector because the private sector pays the bills. The government doesn't pay any bills. So it, it's a little uh, bit of a shell game to compare to other governments. Uh, and there are usually somewhat comparable jobs in the private sector. Uh, I'd love to see that comparison. Uh, just in terms of Measure L, though, I did want to comment on this very slick uh, mailer uh, kind of handout that came at everybody's door. Yes on L, Real Solutions for Homelessness. And I, I know you're well-meaning and everything, but this is probably the most disingenuous piece of political literature I've ever seen. And there's not, a, it's like four pages essentially, and uh, it doesn't even mention that it's a half cent, you know, general purpose sales tax, for instance. Uh, and it's just, it's all effusive, uh, you know, uh, slobbery, you know, pitiful kind of, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, owe to poor homeless, right? And, and yet, you know, you're not obligated to spend not a dime on homelessness. That it is a general tax you can spend on anything. And, and if you did spend money on all the things that are talked about here, it's really mostly all welfare items, not really city services in the normal sense. And every single 
person who, who is uh, says our community agrees and every it's all government officials and some leftist organizations and a lot of nonprofits that stand to gain uh, free money. Um, and uh, I don't see that as really, uh, you know, an union. I don't really see that. I, I think it's disingenuous. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else online? Okay, matter is back before the body. There is a motion and a second for the debate or discussion. Seeing and hearing no, I'm sorry, Ms. Bruner, did you have a question? It's quite all right. Can we get the motion? Yes, it was to approve the recommendation as submitted on page 19.1.1 in our packet. Yeah, uh, and that included the compensation study um, delayed to 24 or 25, which I don't support, so I won't be supporting the motion as it is. Okay, thank you. For the debate or discussion? Well, is it, I don't see a motion on the floor. If I could. Oh, just, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Ms. If Bush, I could. Did I not get a motion in a second? I apologize if I didn't do that. I thought that I had. I don't have one, no. Okay. Is there a motion? Um, I'll move the recommendation and I'm up for a conversation. Ms. Watkins moves. Is there a second? Mr. Newsom seconds. There's a motion and a second. Okay. All right. Motion and a second. Ms. Brown under discussion. Um, so I, I just want to say that I, my comments that I made earlier in, in the questions I asked stand. I'm very concerned about uh, ratifying a delay like this, and with the, especially after hearing the city manager say that it kind of confirming my concern that this, um, this round of adjustments would be weighed against other budget needs. Um, we made a deal with the workers. And I don't believe that um, we, I, I don't believe it's good faith to, to stop now and say we're going to pause and we'll get back to you and that um, perhaps there will be money. Um, the, the workers have, since we, <laughs> since we settled that contract, they have been all in. They have been supporting this city. Every, you all do. Um, to every day in the work that you do, um, but in terms of our efforts to generate additional revenues, they have stepped up, um, and I, I just, I can't in good conscience support making a move like this, which is kicking the can down the road to an uncertain future. Um, if we had a more certain future, um, and we said that these are going to be baked into next year's budget, I would feel more comfortable, um, but I can't support uh, the the move today to just kind of leave that open ended. So I I'd love to hear from my colleagues if anybody else is interested in this. I I could um, put forward a uh, either a substitute motion or an amendment. Ms. Bruner is recognized. Then Ms. Watkins. Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Um, just knowing that it's another four months um, until our. July 1st fiscal year begins and um, you know we have been really working hard on our budget and expenditures and trying to get more revenue in, for our city but all of the capital improvement projects everything all our goals is not possible without city staff and if we don't have the people and we're not investing in the people nothing else matters we can't even do anything else. And the fact that we went through the last couple years really working towards this goal and to even pause it just for four months or I don't, I think that speaks volumes to an opposite of our goal of retention and recruitment. And so um, I, I also share concerns. I understand the fiscal responsibility of this but we have to invest in our people who are working in our city and servicing our city in all the ways that our community needs. And so I think if we can, um, you know, come to an agreement here today with this motion to um, accept this recommendation, but to continue forward with the comp study and to not pause that, um, I know it would go a long way for our city employees and staff, and for me personally as well. I know a lot of the community would appreciate that. Ms. Watkins is recognized. 
I'm happy to ask our city staff if they want to weigh in. My understanding, it was just to come back with a more thorough kind of assessment of what this looks like in the bigger kind of scope of things within the next couple of months or, you know, three months essentially in May. And then not to pause, but to kind of have a more inclusive picture and but but certainly committed to moving forward in this direction. That was what I interpreted. I just want to make sure I'm clear because I don't know if that's clear amongst the council. Yeah, thank you for that question, Councilmember Watkins. That's an accurate characterization of where things stand. And I, I, I do want to just start by saying I, I appreciate the, su the support being expressed by you, Councilmember Brown, and by you, Councilmember Bruner. We all share the concern of continuing to make progress with staying competitive and supporting our employees. Um, just a little bit of history. Back in September when we originally brought this forward, the commitment was to study the feasibility and the costs associated with implementation of phase three. And in good faith, that is what we've brought forward. Sarah and our HR team have been meeting with our employee groups throughout the course of the last uh, several weeks to develop a clear understanding of what the price tag would be and when and how we might implement it. Um, we're just on the horizon of knowing whether or not the sales tax measure will be successful. That'll have a significant impact on our financial trajectory as well as as we build out fiscal year uh, 25. I want, to, I want to make very clear, we're very committed to completing implementation of this comp study, and we're going to be moving on to starting a new one with uh, 2024. So that's just where things stand. We're just, we're not at a point today with clarity and certainty to tell the council that we're in a position to approve this today. Uh, but we expect to have um, a much clearer picture of that over the course of the next month. Great. I appreciate your insights in that way, and that's how I interpreted it, and I am, I think, I share the same commitment to our employees and to furthering the comp study and look forward to having you come and return with a more clearer picture for us. Um, so I don't think there's any interest in not kind of letting that fall by the wayside. I think having that bigger picture makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm comfortable with the recommendation at this time, given that information. Vice Mayor is recognized. I was gonna say, um, I associate myself with your comments and yours, you know, I think that it is important to um, stay competitive, but I think making a dis we're still moving forward with the comp study and everything, but I think waiting until after the results of the March election would be in the best interest of the organization, given the financial uncertainty moving forward. And so um, I want to keep our wages competitive, and I'm committed to that, and I'd want to have, have uh, more clarity in what revenue streams we have and not try to overspend what we don't have and put us into um, a place where we have obligations that we can't meet financially. Ms. Bruner is recognized. Uh, um, I wonder if, um, you know, pausing or if we're not pausing, I still was not clear on what you said. <laughs> It didn't help clarify anything for me. Um, but waiting even a month, the delay is impactful to to everyone. And so, again, four months, one month, um, maybe we don't even have that on here. If there's, we're still moving forward with it, I don't know. Clearly, there is concern from city staff. They showed up. There, some of them spoke. Um, so I see some concerns, and um, I'd like to figure out how we can um, move forward um, with a motion that expressly expresses that we are not pausing or stopping or ending or delaying our comp study and it's still moving forward as is as we directed in previous action and direction thank you i'm going to recognize the city manager then i'm going to recognize council member watkins mr city manager so I, i'm sorry council member bruner if my original description was a little confusing i don't characterize it as a delay because the commitment was to do the feasibility work associated with implementation of phase three without a commitment of when the implementation would take would take place. And we have honored that. Uh, the plan you have before you is work that uh, has been happening just up to today to get a full picture of what the cost would be to map out what Sarah described earlier. Um, our plan is to continue to prioritize implementation of phase three. So I don't, I don't want anyone to leave the room today feeling as though it's not a priority. It is absolutely a priority. 
as as fiscal year 25 takes shape over the over the next couple of months we'll have a much better picture of of um our ability to implement that phase three of the plan i guess um and thank you in response i think it's important to then communicate that our our direction to implement phase three is um, regardless of what the March election, regardless of what is coming, because no, there won't be workers to do the work if we, if we don't invest in the workers. So um, that's first, and that continues, and we see what we have for everything else. Councilmember Watkins. I, the only thing I was going to add, and Matt, you covered it, was that the reason why I believe it's here today is because we gave prior direction to have it return, and what I'm hearing is that we need more time, and we'll have a bigger and better picture in a couple of months. But As to implementation, more time for when we can implement is what your understanding is? For the feasibility study, yeah, right. Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I'm just going to say that, um, you know, we're hearing uh, a message here, and I am seeing workers who have been involved in these negotiations, who have spent a lot more time on this than any of us have, um, seem to disagree. And so I'm not going to take it on faith that um, this is that was the understanding that SEIU members had when they voted on that contract, that we were going to study some things and maybe if we could figure it out, we'd move forward. Um, that, that is not the, the message that I think was delivered. And so I am very, I continue to be concerned and I am not going to support um, uh, taking action that solidifies a pause um, and a kind of ongoing acknowledgement that, of course, workers are our, our priority. We hear that from everybody all the time, no matter what the decision is that's being made. So, you know, there's a trust question here, and I'm just, I, I got to be <clears throat> real about that. There's a reason that we ended up in the position we were in in our last round of negotiations. There is a trust breakdown, and we are restoring it, and making a move like this does nothing. It just, it just, undermines that progress. So I believe that we need to keep moving forward. We need to have um, a clear picture of what the cost is going to be, and it needs to be incorporated into next year's budget if adjustments aren't going to be made in the next couple of months. My, obviously, I would prefer that we get, <laughs> get that done now. I understand there are constraints, but that was a commitment that was made. And I don't think it was just a commitment to study. I don't think we would have settled a strike over a commitment to study. So I'm not going to support a motion that undermines our prioritization of this workforce. I just won't. Ms. Leon. I uh, just wanted uh, to, oh, go ahead. If I could ask you a question uh, and then whatever comment you wish to make. Uh, my question is this. Uh, I am, I am not clear. Others may be, I'm not. Uh, there seems to be a disparity or a gulf here, uh, some difference of an understanding on this question. So when the labor agreement came together and everything was settled, what was the exact action that the city committed to on this particular issue? that it was dependent on funding and council approval. And that we would make a good faith effort, good faith effort towards bridging the gap, essentially, Is based that on that funding status. Is that language in the agreement says? Yes, happy to bring it up if you'd I would like, like you to yep. do that. All right, can I do that? Yep. Just kidding. Um, I can bring it up and then email it to you. Where are you getting it? It's just the city of Santa Cruz MOUs, if you Google it. You bring up the service. What I'm... Uh, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, let, let me do this because we've got another situation developing here right now, which is that the appellant on a previous item has now shown up in council. Oh. So what I'm going to do, I want to explain to them what's going on and so on. We are going to take about a five-minute 
Let's, let's take a 10 minute recess. We're not in a roll call. We have a motion, but we're not in a roll call. We'll come back at 20 after two so I can deal with that person. You can get that document up. We'll be back here in 10 minutes time. Santa Cruz City Council is back in session following an afternoon recess. We are on item 19 on our regular agenda, which is budget adjustments and information on the city's financial status. We have on the table a motion and a second to approve recommendations one through three as presented by the finance staff. Uh, the matter is now still under debate and discussion by the council. I'm going to recognize Ms. Watkins. Ms. Watkins, please proceed. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the conversation and understand the confusion and um, wanting to get clarity on this. And so I wanted to modify my motion. And I will do that at this time if you're ready for that, Bonnie. Okay, so the motion would be to approve the recommendation parts one and two on our agenda and to bring back phase three to implement the compensation study at the second meeting in March. This will just allow for us to have a, and I'll pause there. Do you want me to repeat that? Bring back phase three to implement the compensation study at the second meeting in March. And, if, and then I'll end my motion there and then just have a quick comment to say about that. Is that agreeable to the second of the motion? Oh, yeah. Agreeable. Very good. Open on your motion to amend. Just my understanding is hearing um, for the how to actually implement the phase three requires a budgetary, a, a clear budgetary picture. And after this, the March election, we'll have a better understanding of what that can look like either way. But we'll at least have that information to inform how the implementation could proceed at that point. So essentially, having it come back at the second meeting in March will have a better picture financially of where we're at. And if, Mayor, if it's okay, I can offer our city manager to speak to that a little bit if, if interested. City manager has comments on that? I think Councilmember Watkins captured it well. Um, the primary concern we had with, with implementing uh, that proposal for phase three in advance of that was just not having a clear picture of where things would stand. Regardless of what the outcome of the sales tax measure in March, we'll develop uh, options for the council to consider implementation of phase three. And again, I appreciate the spirit behind the advocacy today. We all share wanting to address these compensation challenges and wanting to support our employees. Thank you. Ms. Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, that was actually what I was um, going to suggest, was to bring back a phase three implementation plan. Um, and for the March 19th meeting, um, this says at the March 26th council meeting. OK, I might have had the dates wrong. but. Um, um, I think that's really important for us, whether or not we know what the, you know, revenue status or whatnot, we have, you know, made a direction to, and to really support and invest in our workers and to come back with options for implementing phase three, I think is, is vital at this point um, as we move forward because we need our our city workers to to do the work and um, to feel valued and to feel compensated in our very expensive city. So, um, if if I think that speaks to the commitment uh, that we can move forward um, with that, and and so thank you for for proactively. Um, going in that direction and clarifying and calling that out. I think it's very important and addresses some of the concerns. Thank you. Further debate or discussion? Seeing, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? 
Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tarr Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. We are on item 20. This is a first reading of <coughs> ordinance amending uncodified ordinance number 2022-16 relating to temporary use of certain adjacent public street and outdoor areas for eligible businesses. Ms. Unit, good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Uh, Rebecca Unit, Economic Development Manager. Um, so the item, item before you this afternoon is uh, an amendment to extend our temporary outdoor uh, expansion program. So this is our outdoor dining program that we uh, launched during the pandemic. Um, we have been implementing our parklet program, which is on public property. Um, and so we are now working on some permanent solutions for the private property spaces. Um, so this extension is dealing just with the private property. Um, and we are proposing or requesting to extend through uh, May 31st of 2025. Um, and that is, um, that would give us about a year for the businesses to be able to have a transition period from when we uh, plan to adopt the permanent changes and then bring them into um, that permanent solution. Uh, so just a bit of background of sort of where we're at on progress toward um, private property uh, permanent policy updates. We've been working with the subcommittee, uh, council members Newsom, Kalantari Johnson, and Bruner um, on those uh, policy changes. We did our initial community engagement with some of our proposed uh, revisions in September of last year. Um, got a lot of really great feedback uh, in terms of how we could further streamline those approaches, um, make this uh, easier and, um, and uh, more streamlined for those businesses. So uh, we're now finalizing our revisions and we'll be meeting with the businesses and the community again uh, in the beginning of March um, with the goal of bringing that to the Planning Commission end of March and hopefully to the Council uh, end of April and May for final adoption, if we're able to work through that um, and, and get that good feedback going. So. Um, well, happy to answer any questions um, and uh, would appreciate um, the recommendation. Very good. Let me see if council members have questions. I'll start on my right, moving around here. There we go. No questions. Uh, I will just say I had a, a, a conversation during the break very briefly with Ms. Lipscomb about an item that a business has brought to my attention that does not relate to the private property side, but instead the public property side will be engaging in a conversation offline uh, and maybe uh, looking at, at something in the future. Uh, but no, uh, no questions or comments. Let me offer the opportunity to folks who are with us today to comment on this item. Is there, please come forward. Good afternoon. Hello, my Hello. name is uh, Karen Madura, and I'm here representing Brady's Yacht Club and the Jury Room um, and other businesses that are interested. And I wanted to speak in support of um, extending this and also to thank everybody for their hard work in uh, working with us and hoping to make these patios permanent for our community. So thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Oh, okay, this is good again. I, I didn't really prepare anything for this. It's really the same old story. Uh, I understand in the pandemic measures had to be taken to help businesses and so forth, but we're well beyond that. And and although you did sort of say here that this is about private property, that it, to me, I, I don't know, reading it, it talks about outdoor uh, maybe that's public space also, but as regards public space, just in general, as I've said many times before, you know, you are stealing public property and renting it to private individuals when it comes to permanent parklets on city streets, and you are violating the public's right of way for no good reason, really. Uh, permanently, you've even, you know, uh, contemplated, and there have been judgments in the past where uh, exclusive uh, use permits of public property were revoked because there just wasn't in the public interest. And uh, it, it's this, you know, you're kind of charging a lot of money for these things. And I'm not sure that that's, it, that you, you know, violating the public's right of way is really in their interest. So um, 
you know, <laughs> this should all come to an end, you know, at some point. Thanks. Thank you. Matters back before the council. Excuse me. <coughs> Matters back before the council. I'll move the <laughs> People are moving around. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Watkins moves. Uh, Ms. Bruner seconds. There, there we go. Very good. Uh, for the debate or discussion scene, please. I just wanted to um, say that this has been a process um, and um, we're working really hard to um, get through um, regulatory um, policy and measures and public safety aspects of outdoor seating on private property. And um, our um, staff that we've been working with on this topic, I sit on this subcommittee, has been working really diligently. And so I wanted to acknowledge them on it, and I wanted to acknowledge the core group of businesses that have been also working to give very specific constructive input and feedback to help us work through all the components. So what this does is it allows um, all of those businesses to continue operating under their temporary permits for another year because um, that's the reality of what is needed. And so um, I, I'm happy to support this and continue to work through and get to a place where um, we have a policy in place that will be in place going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Further comment? Ms. Kalantari Johnson is recognized. Yeah. Thank you. Just also briefly wanted to um, thank the businesses that have worked with us, um, city staff. This has been a huge lift. The public, um, mm -hmm. the, the public property framework that we came up with um, didn't have as many nuances and hurdles for us to go through, and so it's taking us longer than anticipated, but it's taking us longer because this is what collaboration is about. <laughs> it takes a little longer. We're listening to the businesses, we're listening to the neighbors, um, and we're trying to come up with a plan that's feasible to implement and best for the community. So just thank you for all the work to the staff and to um, the businesses we've been working with, and my council colleagues. Vice Mayor is recognized. Thank you. I just have a brief um, thank you to everybody for bringing this forward, and I also am really excited. I know it's something that we had talked about prior to the pandemic, and I think if there's one ray of light that's come out of the pandemic is bringing this forward, I think it creates a festive dining atmosphere and for socialization, and it feels very European and fun when we're eating outside, and I just appreciate that we're trying to bring this to permanence. So thank you, everybody. Very good. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 21. This is a review of recent state legislation uh, regarding land use and housing. Mr. Van Waal, Mr. Butler, good afternoon. Nice to see you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Good afternoon. Matt Van Wa, Principal Planner, Advanced Planning. Share my screen here. This up. This stay up too, Tommy. I see this still on the screen. Does it? Okay. Great. Yeah, thanks again, everyone. Um, just to give a brief uh, before I go into the the more recent 2023 legislation that was passed uh, this past year and is uh, going into effect as of January of this year, uh, I wanted to provide a, a larger legislation background on what's, what's really been passed in the last like five or six years and kind of what has led to uh, the work going forward right now. Um, and it's really a, 
a start to that, uh, we have the Housing Accountability Act, which has been around since 1982 and has recently been, has gotten much more robust. Housing Accountability Act states, California has a housing supply and affordability crisis of historic proportions. And that's really a good framing point for where the state is coming at uh, in regards to uh, uh, supporting a lot of this legislation that's moving forward. So in 2017, um, California found that there was nearly 2 million homes uh, unmet, backlog, and that equates to about uh, 180,000 units per year to get to the point uh, by 2025 where we start to meet housing needs. So far, we've only, the statewide has only been approving around 100,000 of those. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still a significant housing shortage uh, and backlog. And so since 2017, we've now seen at least 129, to, to my count, at least 129 housing related bills passed. Uh, just in the last seven years, uh, which is you know, really remarkable. Um, so na navigating, you know, all these new directives from the state certainly makes our work much more complex. Um, and at the same time, it's important to appreciate uh, where the state is coming from in a lot of these ways to, to really support moving housing forward as much as possible. So again, I, I wanted to provide an, another quote further. Uh, to provide even more context. Uh, so the, the Housing About Accountability Act uh, from 1982 underwent a significant uh, amendment in 2017 that really kicked off a lot of this housing legislation that we've seen going forward. And so uh, just to read the, the back half of this, uh, meaningfully, and, and, uh, um, meaningfully and, and effectively curbing the capability of local governments to deny reduce the density for or render infeasible housing development projects and emergency shelters. That intent has not been fulfilled. So again, the state is really looking to create uh, more legislation to, uh, to bring local governments uh, forward in, in supporting housing. And so as part of that amendment in 2017 to the Housing Accountability Act, you'll see it as HAA and a few places. So it significantly strengthened the HAA uh, and it really reduced the power of jurisdictions uh, to deny or place conditions on a project that renders it infeasible. And it also uh, required that review standards, uh, you know, development review standards are, are set at the time the application is deemed complete. Uh, prior to this legislation actually, if up until 2016, you could have a project that comes in and two months later, if the community or council didn't like the project, they could have passed different setbacks or different height requirements uh, to essentially kill the project. Uh, and this really uh, uh, didn't allow for those goalposts to change anymore. So that was the first kind of significant change in legislation. There were subsequent Housing Accountability Act amendments. Uh, in 2018, it went even further and, and spoke to uh, the consistency between the zoning ordinance and the general plan, uh, and where inconsistent, it would, the greater standard for housing production would prevail. Uh, that was a large change because many jurisdictions across the state have a general plan that's general and, and has goals and uh, uh, what, it, what it wants to be someday, or what they hope to change it to someday, uh, but the zoning might not have necessarily have been to that level. Um, and when this came along, the state was really saying, no, whatever standards you have, even if your zoning isn't there yet, you have to allow it. That was a large change for planning. And then SB 330, uh, we've, heard that, we've probably heard that uh, before, the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. That really instituted objective standards, which we've seen come before council, um, and then prohibits reducing the intensity of land use. That's a no net loss provision, uh, as well as prohibiting housing moratoriums, housing caps, or, or delaying approval. And it also, uh, importantly, added tenant protections, such as replacement units, uh, relocation benefits, and first right of refusal, refusal for housing units displaced by a housing development project. 
And then affordable housing streamlining of 2017, that, that's SB 35, uh, which has come before council as well. That streamlined review processes uh, for qualifying housing projects that meet a certain affordability percentage uh, and sets review times, uh, limits public hearings, and, the, and no CEQA as well. And this is really based on uh, the regional housing needs allocation, which we've talked about if, if this uh, arena, um, if the city is not meeting its arena in certain affordability categories, that is really what uh, allows SB 35 to kick in. And um, what, what happens with that review is every year, the city does an annual progress report to, the, uh, to HCD uh, the state's uh, housing and community development department and every f based on how many units we're producing uh, and approving every four years the state takes a tally of that and essentially if we're meeting our pro rated share of rena then we qualify for not being an sp35 city if we're not meeting that then we would fall into the streamlining process uh, so we have the, the annual progress report coming before council uh, in a couple months here, month and a half. Uh, that will show that the city met all of its arena requirements, uh, this, this latest housing element cycle. Uh, so we, we should be found to not be under the streamlining for the next four years. Uh, but beyond that, that, that next count kicks in. If we're not meeting that share, again, that's when SB 35 would, would come back. And, and that's uh, if we're not meeting low and very low affordable housing requirements under RENA, uh, or the targets, I should say, not requirements, uh, then it's a 50% affordable project that would qualify for SB 35. And if we're not meeting our above moderate market rate housing um, under the RENA target, then uh, any project uh, with 10% affordability would qualify and that's 10% or the city's inclusionary rate. So either way, uh, most projects under that circumstance would qualify for this SB 35 streamlining. Then accessory dwelling unit legislation, there is a lot of this in the last four or five years. Jessica Water here. A large one was in 2019 where this omnibus of, of bills was passed to streamline approval, remove parking requirements, increase square footage, remove lot coverage, uh, and decrease setback requirements. Another one more recently was uh, uh, AB 2221, um, and that reduced minimum setbacks, allowed front yard development, and increased height development. This was one in particular where we, uh, we intend to uh, formally bring this into our ordinance, but we currently have an urgency ordinance uh, in place that has been uh, approved and extended by council until we do a larger accessory dwelling unit ordinance work. And I bring this up because this, in this particular instance, the, the state uh, and HCD are very interested in pushing cities to have these ordinances adopted to meet the, these, this state legislation. They actually want to see this state legislation in local ordinances, uh, unlike things like density bonus, which the state hasn't put a pressure on to actually have in local ordinances. This in particular, there's a lot of pressure now uh, from the state and a lot of interest in, in bringing, these, bringing this legislation into the local ordinance. And, and just as an aside, uh, should measure impasse, for instance, we, we talked about this at the previous meeting, this would be an example of to meet the state requirement and to appease HCD and bring this into conformance in our local ordinance. Uh, that would trigger a vote of the people, for instance, because this is talking about high requirements and, uh, and uh, greater allowances, uh, FAR, things like that. Then other important recent legislation, I'll, I'll try to run through fast here, uh, AB 2345. Uh, increased uh, d density bonus maximums to 50%. There was already greater allowances for 100% affordable, uh, up to 80%, but this changed from 35 to 50% in, in 2020. Uh, SB 9 
uh, allowed for two homes on a single family lot and it allowed for that lot to also be split into two so you could have potentially four homes on a single family on a single family lot and then AB 2097 which uh, again we recently brought to council to to bring our ordinance up to date on was a no minimum parking requirement in your transit so now we'll go into uh, 2023 legislation uh, again it was it was a, a very active year and the state legislator and a uh, number of bills were passed over 60 and I'm, I'm just going to do a very quick rundown of, of kind of the largest ones and happy to answer any more questions on them too after uh, AB 1287 uh, speaking of density bonus this actually increased the uh, maximum density bonus uh, for market rate development to a hundred percent so any project now what what would happen is a project could come in and it first has to meet that 50 percent requirement that's been standard the last three years um, and, and then this bill added certain ways for that 50 percent to be doubled to 100 percent and that's either through adding moderate or very low income only uh, not low income uh, in particular uh, so this 100 percent could only be achieved through a uh, moderate or very low uh, affordability um, as that bonus um, sb4 uh, was a by right approval of housing and church and school sites and uh, this would allow this would allow home uh, uh, residential development on these sites uh, to a standard that would be similar to what would be allowed on other sites nearby or uh, kind of the closest applicable zoning or general plan standard to a development like that uh, plus plus one story uh, so it allows slightly more than what we currently allow now and SB 423 uh, this was a big one too we, we spoke to SB 35 and that streamlining that was actually set to sunset in 2025 and this bill was passed this, this uh, past year uh, to not only extend those SB 35 streamlining requirements to 2036, it also expanded them into the coastal zone, which it previously was not uh, was not a part of. So that's a, a significant part of our city that's now also open, open to that as well. Should SB 35 be enacted here? Is yeah. 2036 a year? Or yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yep. That is the. Yep. Thank you. And then uh, SB 684, uh, this was a ministerial approval, which is essentially over the counter building approval. Uh, there's no planning process really uh, for up to 10 unit projects in uh, multifamily zoning. So there's a number of, uh, number of bills around the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, uh, that were passed as well. Uh, AB 1307 uh, found that residential noise is not an impact under CEQA. This stemmed from a specific student housing project in Berkeley, uh, uh, People's Park, if, if you've heard of that one. Um, AB, and, and that one in particular, I'll say that near all of these bills, that, except for this one, went into effect on January 1st. This was actually an urgency ordinance that went into effect as soon as it was signed September 7th I think of last year AB 1449 uh, is a CEQA exemption for 100 percent affordable housing and then AB 1633 uh, this this essentially uh, again was kind of in the spirit of the Housing Accountability Act where uh, projects that qualify for a CEQA exemption are entitled to that exemption uh, before there could be findings made somehow that even though even if a project was exempt that maybe it wasn't exempt um, and this this kind of put a put a stop to that and that's a uh, and also that ruled that local government must certify an EIR uh, if there's substantial evidence to support that certification so it really raised that bar to if a if an EIR comes before council along with a project uh, it's it raises the bar to to deny that EIR 
essentially. There's higher standards in place. And kind of along with that too, uh, SB 439 at the bottom there uh, really heightens the standard for CEQA challenges of 100% affordable projects. Um, and so it really, what, what it essentially does was say that uh, if there's a 100% affordable project, uh, the CEQA, uh, CEQA challenge to that had to, had to meet some immediate standards by the state and that the state could step in much faster and deny that, that uh, appeal to allow this, to allow affordable housing to go forward. So it gave the state a lot more power to step in and say that's, that's a frivolous appeal, doesn't meet our standards and allows the housing to go forward, uh, specifically the 100% affordable housing. Accessory dwelling units, uh, there's several of these passed this year too. Uh, AB 1332 was a streamlined 30-day uh, review of pre-approved ADU plans. And so those are ADUs, uh, for instance, in Santa Cruz, uh, maybe an ADU has been uh, approved already on a different site. And if, those, if that same set of plans is essentially brought to another site and used you know, there's, there might be site differences and things like that, but essentially the actual construction of the project uh, has been approved already, uh, then it qualifies for the streamlined review. Uh, the next two, um, there's the owner occupancy requirement prohibition extended beyond 2025. That went in place in 2020 and, and was set to sunset in 2025. Now there's, a, now it is, there's no sunset. It's extended indefinitely this prohibition on owner occupancy. Um, and currently, uh, Santa Cruz has owner occupancy requirements pre-2020 for the state legislation. And so this is one area where we uh, staff intend to bring back a proposal to remove that requirement in keeping with this requirement being removed from 2020 onward for all other ADUs. Uh, so when we bring back that urgency ordinance that I spoke about the other 2022 changes that were made. Uh, this, this will be part of that. Another thing for council's consideration, uh, AB 1033, uh, it, it gives cities the discretion uh, to allow ADUs to be sold separately as condos. Um, really interesting bill. There's, there's a lot of pluses to this. It could allow for a lot of new home ownership opportunities and and uh, a variety of homes. ADUs tend to be smaller, uh, likely more affordable than a standard single family house. Mm -hmm. So really improves ownership opportunities. At the same time, uh, the one negative might be that you still could have displacement of those current uh, ADU residents that are currently renting from these same ones that will then be sold. Um, so should council be interested in looking at this further as part of this ADU work that we're doing over the summer? Uh, the spring and summer, uh, we could look at additional anti-displacement uh, strategies if, if council were interested in supporting something like this. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as well. You're welcome to comment further on that if you like. And then finally, just some additional legislation. Uh, AB 821 uh, is really further seeking to resolve general plan and zoning conflicts if necessary. There's actually still a few places in the city where uh, our objective standards, which went through a couple of years ago now, uh, did a substantial amount of resolving those conflicts. Uh, there still are some parcels in the city for one reason or another that didn't fall under that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this was really just to further say that we, we should and that if a project goes forward in one of these sites, we still have to follow the Housing Accountability Act, which we which we would anyway. Uh, but again, it's one of those ones, if we brought this fully into conformance, uh, those sites would likely be upzoned to meet the, the current general plan standard and, and may also trigger a vote, for instance. Um, and then AB 1218 extended SB 330's uh, tenant protections uh, to commercial development proposals as well. So if commercial proposes a project, or if a, pro a commercial project is proposed on a site that has someone living there currently, there would be those additional tenant protections uh, for that commercial project as well, and they would have to meet relocation benefits and uh, replacement housing, things like that. Before, under SB 330, that was only for a housing development project. 
So that concludes my update. Thank you. Mr. Van Wall, thank you very much. I suspect we're going to have a couple of questions, maybe even a couple of comments. So I'm going to start on my left, work my way to my right. Ms. Bruner, questions or comments? Certainly will. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Yes, thank you. Thanks for distilling these complex um, state legislations for us. Um, let's see. I got to look at my notes. Um, okay, SB 4, by right approval of affordable housing on church and school sites. So is that, so is that how is affordable housing defined and is it uh, at projects that are 100% affordable housing? It is 100% affordable. Okay, and it's very low income and low income categories? Yes. Okay, and um, I guess just a question and a comment that AB 976, the ADU owner occupancy, I know we've talked about this in our housing element subcommittee. This is something that's come to my attention um, of, of going to that pre-2020 pre-occupancy and changing that. So I'm glad that we're looking at that. I wonder if um, planning has a, a timeline in mind of when that could come before us. Just as constituents reach out to me because they continue to, mm. I want to be able to have a sense of what that looks like. That, that, that will likely come before council in the fall. Okay, pretty quickly. Yeah. Those are my questions for now, thank you. Thanks, Madam Vice Mayor. I do, I have four questions. Um, my first question is, so if a school or a church were to build one of these affordable um, housing projects, like the one we saw earlier this afternoon, um, could they build it by right, even if it's, let's say, like sensitive habitat or historic, Something. or would other, could other things potentially impact that? That, that's a good question. I'll dig into the legislation okay. a little bit further and get back to you on that one, Vice Mayor. I think there, there typically are provisions that, that allow for things like that to be considered in a review process, uh, uh, even a by right one. Cool. I, that's just a, something so that I'll, came I, up to I will, me. I'll double check on that one for you. And then I forget which one it was, but in regards to the noise, as we're seeing um, proposals come forward kind of in our industrial areas, like on the far west side or down by Harvey West, this has been an issue I know where there was the foam factory over here and it abutted a neighborhood. Um, and so I just wonder strategically when we're developing housing in our industrial zones, like be mindful that we still need our industrial zones because that's where jobs are. And so I think, I don't, even, I don't know if there's more of a question or a comment, but is that something that we can still kind of consider in our overall planning? Like if something zoned industrial, do we have to approve housing projects necessarily there because I just anticipate future complaints and then and then we'd lose industrial. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we uh, planning uh, both as a uh, both as our department and okay. also our planning documents such as the general plan and the housing element that was recently approved all have a, a policy in them to keep industrial industrial. And, and to only support residential in, in cases where they're still able to have a full employment capacity uh, achieved on those industrial lands. Yeah. So that's been our current policy to, again, yeah, kind of hold as much industrial and job lands as possible. Uh, that legislation that was specifically passed around noise was regarding housing projects and not being able to uh, call a housing project an impact by way of noise. Um, so we'd still have to consider that vice, vice versa. It, it doesn't account for industrial so much, but certainly industrial noise would be something to, you know, take into consideration as we're putting housing in it or near it, things like that. Sure. Thank you. And then um, I had a question, of, or I guess more of a, a um, I guess it's a, I don't know, AB uh, 1033, this idea of ADUs being sold as condos, I think that's really exciting. I think entry-level uh, market rate housing is something that the community um, needs to be, for people to get their foot in the door. My only um, thing, and I don't know if it's changed, back when we were first-time home buyers and the second time we bought a home, both times my understanding was that the lease supersedes the purchase. So both times we were barely scraping to make the purchase, but we had to keep the tenant in there for the full duration of their lease. And for those people, it was almost a year for some of them. And so then we had to kind of subsidize, we had to pay rent where we were, 
and then pay our new $5,000 a month mortgage and then only get back from them the thousand that they were paying in rent. And so it was like a real hardship for us to get through that year as first time home buyers. So I think before implementing tenant protections, look at what already exists because my understanding is a lease or a rental agreement would already supersede and there's already significant um, protections in place in that event and I wouldn't want it to be an undue hardship for people trying to get their foot in the door as a first time home buyer. This my comment question about that. And then my finally my last thing and I'd already talked to um, Matt Huffaker briefly about this the other day is I went to a an event with the mayor of San Jose and I think they are implementing something that I would love to see us maybe look at moving forward with this bundle and um, it would it was where local architects and designers that we work with frequently have a streamlined process where they can self-certify to help projects move along. Um, they take a test or they do something. I'm not sure we could see what they're doing over in San Jose, but it's helping them move projects along at kind of no extra expense to the city because their license is really what's on the line. And so they're, you know, I don't know. It just might be worth exploring um, in the next coming months. So thank you for all your hard work as always. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're certainly aware of the, the San Jose program and it is a very good one. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll look at that further. This legislation was kind of based off that a little bit yeah. uh, and does it in just a little bit lighter way. Uh, but San Jose four or five years ago um, created a, had, had some kind of budget and uh, created a project around you know, building out a whole website of pre-approved plans and, and architects. Yeah, thanks. Council Member Watkins. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, Council Member Brown and I were remembering when there wasn't a whole bunch of legislation to, to present, and since 2017, there certainly has been a lot of action on behalf of the state in this area. So a lot has grown in our legislative presentations in this area, um, which is in some ways good, in some ways really challenging for local jurisdictions, right? One of the questions I had that um, wasn't already asked, or sort of maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more on, is the ADUs uh, sold separately as condos? I just was curious about that. I certainly agree with what um, Vice Mayor Golder shared in regards to entry to home ownership, but does that look like splitting lots? What does that look like for parking requirements? I think there's a lot of also, um, just seems really interesting to me in terms of what that means for land use and home ownership and lot size and everything in division and all of that and, and rights. So a lot of these are in the back of people's houses. So anyways, if you wanna speak to that, I don't know what that would look like. Yeah, I, uh, agreed. If if we were to go forward with this, we'd still have to work out a, a specific way to to draw those lines and figure out the parking. Um, a, lo a lot of parking now for ADUs, for instance, uh, have all been removed. Uh, so I, I don't think transitioning them. I'll double check the legislation on that uh, as a parking requirement. Um, Interesting. But there, yeah, there would be. We you'd have to figure out how to do the deed and the the lot split things like that. Right. Mr. Butler, good walk. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Just to add to that, uh, and first introducing myself, Lee Butler. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the City. And Council Member Watkins, um, we would anticipate that those subdivisions occur in a condominium process and so there wouldn't actually be lot lines that are drawn, um, but the airspace subdivision. So you could own um, individual airspaces, the interior of the uh, main residence and the four walls and interior of the ADU. And then there would be something written up in the deed about how um, the, uh, the shared space is used, the parking and so forth. Um, but we wouldn't anticipate actual lot lines. There are approaches as, as Matt was mentioning, SB9, can allow for subdivision of single family lots, but this particular bill is more aimed at um, airspace condominium subdivisions for accessory dwelling units. Interesting. So then if they were to, so you would say to do that and then they were to sell that, then what does that look like? They could sell it independently. So, the main so if you had an, yes, if you had an ADU in the backyard, um, you could then um, sell just the ADU um, and the airspace rights. Um, it would be similar to a, a condominium in a uh, multifamily mm -hmm. complex, except there, you know, the airspaces are horizontal and vertical. Um, 
And here, the airspace would just be defined by the, the space of the ADU. But it, it could be an attached ADU, uh, similar to what you would see with the multifamily development. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be a, a detached ADU. Interesting. I'm not sure if I fully understand what that looks like in terms of the average ADU in Santa Cruz, because it seems really <laughs> challenging from a homeowner's perspective of what that would look like and what the cells or resell of that could be. But, you know. We'll see when that comes forward and it's more fleshed out. Sure. Um, but I appreciate the clarification. That does help a little bit for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Brown. Well, thank you for the thorough overview. I, I want to say to members of the public who are not present here in the chambers, but maybe listening online, uh, that this uh, the document that you produced really is an overview, a historical recent timeline of what's happened, how you know how we got here to the kind of constrained decision making authority we have. So I really highly encourage folks out there to. Um, take a look at it if you want to better understand the, um, the the major changes that have taken place. And just, I don't really have uh, questions. I've been following most of this legislation uh, and have a, a general sense of the totality of it and some of the the bigger pieces. Um, but I did want to ask about, um, as we know, the new legislator, the second year of this two year session is in full swing now, and more bills are coming. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you're where you're at with uh, kind of diving into that analysis and if we can get an update about what some of those might mean. I don't know that we need a whole presentation, but it would be great to just keep getting updated maybe with a memo or something about what's coming our way. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that comment, Councilmember Brown. Um, I'd just like to note that um, one of the things that um, I do is I sit on the American Planning Association legislative review team, and um, we have a review uh, period that is starting in the next few weeks and um, then will uh, culminate in a, a meeting of statewide planners who get together to discuss the uh, upcoming legislation, and then that um, serves as a, as a sounding board for the Legislative Review Committee to present to the American Planning Association of California's uh, board that then lobbies on behalf of the planners statewide. And so um, we do get involved early in that process, and we're happy to give you an update on um, some of the key bills that we see coming down the, the line for this upcoming year. Um, things change all the way up to the last minute, of course, <laughs> and so you never know um, if uh, a provision is going to stay or if a, a curveball is going to come in at the very end or if something's not going to make it out of committee, but um, we can give you an update on um, some of the, the key legislation that we think will be most impactful to the city of Santa Cruz um, should it proceed in the current state. Council Member Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, for the for the very thorough presentation and for the agenda report. This is really good. I had um, uh, just a, 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 say three clarifying questions, very quick questions about SB 423, which I think just continues SB uh, 35. Uh, and and I, you may have mentioned this in your um, in the presentation. I'm, uh, my apologies if I missed it, but. Uh, when did the streamlining provisions of that bill kick in? You know, say after how many years of a city not meeting their prorate arena targets, do they enter into that ministerial process or that streamlined process for development projects that uh, we were talking about? You were talking about. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember. Good question. Uh, the city submits its annual progress report to State HCD, and on April 1st of every year, by about mid June, it. It really depends on how quickly they get through everything. But around mid-June, uh, certainly by July, they publish a list of all the cities that meet or don't meet that requirement. And if you're, if you're on the list, that's, that's the start. That's their official, uh, that's, the, that's the official timing of when, when you're subject to SB 35. Okay, so it's, so it's an uh, every year uh, look at if you're meeting your prorate or arena targets or not. Yeah, they, we submit that every year, uh, but that that total, that uh, prorated amount, is only calculated every four years, actually. So 
uh, the state is giving uh, jurisdiction some amount of time to try to meet that arena target. Um, um, and so it's, it's only calculated at a four year period. Now, the downside to that is that uh, uh, if, you, if, you aren't, if you aren't meeting it, uh, that uh, prorated share mm -hmm. at your fourth year, you're subject to SB 35 requirements for the next four years. Even if you had some huge housing boom and built all your housing in year five or year six, those next four years are, mm -hmm. are you're, it's not counted until it's, it's only every four years. Okay, thank you, and that, that answers my uh, my second question. So basically you have four years to meet your prorate arena target. If you don't meet it at year four, then by SB 35, you enter into this ministerial process for the next four years. Can you provide just a little more insight into what a ministerial process is or what, what that means? Yeah, the ministerial process is essentially uh, just requiring a, a building permit. It bypasses most planning approval. It would still have to meet objective standards. Uh, but beyond that, it, it goes right to the building department and and that streamlining process uh, really limits the number of uh, community meetings. Uh, there's no CEQA, things of that nature as well. Okay, thank you. So if you don't meet your prorate arena targets within four years, in the next four years, you entered into this ministerial process where as long as a development project meets your objective standards, they basically move forward without a sequel analysis or anything of that nature. Correct. Yeah, uh, similar to uh, what council and, and the public saw with the A three one water project a few years ago. That was our our first SB thirty five project. Thank you, Ms. Bruner. Back to you. Uh, thank you for presenting all of those new um, legislative bills. Uh, my questions are um, on SB, um, we talked briefly about um, ADUs sold separately as condos, SB 1033. Um, and I, I, I guess I was going in the direction of Council Member Watkins in um, what that looks like, we don't know yet. You're simply presenting this report of all these new updates that have come before us. So um, I guess my question is, can you speak about how this will all come together forward? Are you applying these automatically? Do you need future council direction to work on implementing some of these? You mentioned 10. Um, if anybody was interested in working on it, what what are the next steps regarding all of this? What's automatic and what, what, if any, how does this all apply now going forward? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we, we look to be uh, proposing amendments to our accessory dwelling unit ADU ordinance um, in, in that fall time frame, as, as I had mentioned. And a lot of that is bringing forward the the state legislation that passed in 2022 uh, for heights and setbacks, uh, uh, allowing ADUs in front yards, things like that. Uh, a lot of this had a had a requirement per the state to to move into our our local ordinance, uh, and so we will be doing that. Um, and so with that ADU ordinance opened up and and us working on it. Um, we intended also as part of this to, to work on the owner occupancy and also propose uh, a change to that as well uh, in our ordinance. And this is something uh, as far as the condos sold separately uh, per council direction, uh, that's something we could look into further as well and include in this package uh, if council so wishes. I guess then my question is all of these should be looked into and and I mean does it require each one for us to say please look into how that would apply here in the city or are, I mean is it just that one like how does this work yeah the, this one in particular called for uh, local discretion uh, so that's why we just highlighted that specifically it's not a state requirement it's just something the state said you can now we're, we're allowing you to do this if you would like to um, Lee? 
Go ahead. Thanks. I, I was just going to add on that that um, because it is a local discretion issue, um, and um, we wanted to bring that up and, and gauge the sentiment of the council. What I'm hearing is there's some general interest. If, if we had heard from everyone on the council saying, no, let's not proceed with that, then we wouldn't be spending our time working on something that uh, the council has indicated they, they don't have an interest in. And so um, hearing that there is interest from a number of the council members, we will proceed with that. Um, I also wanted to add to uh, the other comment uh, or the other uh, response to your question, Councilmember Bruner, and I want to be clear for members of the public about what we will be recommending to the council when it comes forward. Matt had mentioned that we will be um, recommending some additional owner occupancy um, changes. The state has said for accessory dwelling units, no owner occupancy requirements from 2020 on in perpetuity now. It was 2020 to 2025 for building permits getting pulled, and now it's in perpetuity. And so with that being the case, we will be recommending to the council that we remove the owner occupancy requirements for those ADUs that were constructed prior to 2020. And so that will, the, the state law does not cover that, but given that everyone moving forward doesn't have that restriction, we believe it's important to also have that, um, that same standard apply to everyone retroactively. Um, that is going to take, uh, act, it would require one, once, if, assuming council approves that, I should say, it would still take uh, action on part of the homeowners because um, there are actually deed restrictions on those. But um, we would come up with a streamlined process for that. So I want to daylight that for any homeowners who are out there who are contemplating, hey, maybe I'm, I'm thinking about moving, but I can't because we've got this owner occupancy requirement. Um, that is something that we'll be presenting in the future to the council. And then I guess one more quick question. Or did you want to quickly? Just a quick add on to that to speak to your question, Councilmember Bruner, about how the council could be involved in running some of these questions to ground. Uh, we had established a housing element ad hoc subcommittee of the council. Now that we've completed and certified the, the housing element, what the council could consider is perhaps standing up a standing subcommittee around housing legislation and development that we could use as a sounding board for this work as we move forward. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. And uh, I think that's really important. And there was some mention of San Jose. And I think, I believe San Francisco, where they have some um, ability, for example, a duplex, it might be a house with two units, one on top of each other, and now it's separate for purchase. Um, so not just looking at ADUs, but maybe taking a step back and looking at home ownership opportunities in many different creative, if it's a triplex or a row of cottages, how, you know, is, is there potential if the owner wanted to sell and have it be separate for purchase um, condos or whatever language you want to call those types of housing. So um, I, I think that's a great way to look at potential homeownership stock. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. You want to talk to the housing element? Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that's a great point. And that that flexibility is something we certainly want to look into and and is also uh, our, in some of our objectives in the housing element, too, mm -hmm. um, that we seek to complete by 2026, I yes. believe. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yes, as, as part of the implementation of um, SB9, we do have some provisions um, related to that, and the council will recall um, you authorized uh, us to apply for a grant, uh, the REAP 2.0 grants back in August. Um, uh, that would have also furthered some of that work. Unfortunately, we did not get that grant award, um, but it is still on our radar, and we, we have it in the housing element. It will just be not as front-loaded as it would have been had we received that money. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That concludes. Thank you very much. The vice mayor is recognized. I had one that I wanted to piggyback on that 1033 and, and um, 
Council Member Bruner's idea is if we could come up with some draft CC, are they CCNRs, CCRs, like for, you know, the rules that go with the condo association that could be, you know, help people because I think a, a barrier might also be um, the legal costs associated with setting up whatever, you know, I'm does that make sense? Yeah, I think I don't really know if to. there's an ordinance presented to the council, one option would be to yeah have some model CCNRs um, that are just sort of presented to folks. I mean, ultimately, they're sort of entering into this legal agreement with each other, and hopefully yeah. they have their own attorneys look at things. Um, but I fully hear what you're saying, and I think we can assist on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I don't think I have questions necessarily as a, a couple of comments. Um, one is I, I have found since I've been on the council that there are three items that tend to be on many agenda items as a requirement of our how we operate here. The environmental review, fiscal impact, and then of course health and all policies. Thank you. <laughs> health and all policies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I wonder, it, it caused me to think about the following concept. So we go for 150 years in California with home rule, local control, little bit of state intervention, CEQA, the Coastal Act, a few things here and there. But by and large, the locals are in charge of land use. The state stays out of it and does other things. Pretty light touch over at HCD on your housing element and certification, what you get to be eligible for or not. And frankly, in some cases, it was so uninteresting given what you would have to do to get them cert get your housing elements. So you just kind of say, well, I'll keep your money and would, would kind of do it our way. And I, I th that varied, 400, 500 cities in California, 58 counties, all being done a different way, people doing things differently. And we get to our community, and 1978, the voters passed Measure J, uh, the Growth Management Ordinance in the county. And then that's followed pretty quickly by the Greenbelt Initiative to essentially say we're not growing out any larger than we are now. So the ethic or the value or what gets politically rewarded from a policy perspective in Santa Cruz, city and county for 40 or plus years is managing our growth, uh, finding ways to say, frankly, no to too many things, but always a way to, well, we can make this better if we do this, reduce, reduce some units or require some more on-site parking, whatever it is, that was left to us to do. What seems to me to be happening, I, look, I've never had an original thought in my, not, my, my life, so you're no danger it's going to happen now. <laughs> but, but, but I think what is pretty evident is that the state has said enough of that. Um, you have Governor Newsom, who is formerly a local government person. You've got Scott Weiner, formerly a local government person. You've got probably 65, 70 percent of the legislature all had been city council members, mayors, supervisors. Uh, but they got to Sacramento, and I think in the last several years, their view is we didn't do enough. When, when we were in local government, we didn't do enough. And we erected too many barriers to this. And that gets churned a lot up there, which is to say you have some number of communities which had the same view of growth that our community has had for decades. You've had other communities who have a much more uh, embracing view of growth. But when you make state law, you make one that deals with the city of Los Angeles and, you know, the city of whatever that has 350 people. You make the law for all of them. So it seems that what the legislature has done in that regard with these mm, 12 dozen bills is that they have said, uh, we are no longer comfortable that you and local government will do the job. So we are going to take a whole bunch of tools out of your toolbox for saying no. The state is reshaping the entire field. So here, with that as the background, this, this occurs to me. We eat and breathe this stuff all the time, so we're very aware of it. 
but we get to the 1800 SoCal project or the food bin or the whatever, and I think for most people, their view is, well, this is this issue in my neighborhood, and I've lived in Santa Cruz for X period of time, and what I have learned from the community is you fight this this way, you fight this this way, you fight this, and you're going to get a response. You're going to get a response. So now we end up, and I think 1800 SoCal was a really good example, where you and I did a little thought experiment in front of the public. You know, if this was 2017, what would we do if we had the same community input? And the answer was you'd reduce the units and increase the on-site parking and be done with it, and that would be that. And what we got to do instead was scribe a couple little 10-foot lines with red paint and said that's the best we can do now under the state law. And I'm being dramatic for a reason. I don't know if I'm being dramatic, but I'm overstating it a bit. And that, that, that's my point, is to do that. But I think what's, what's going to happen over the next several years is we will be way ahead of the public in terms of our understanding about what we can do and not do. And, and what I don't think, you know, I'll be gone in two and a half years or whatever, and, but the other people who come in and fill these seats, uh, they're going to have an electorate, which I suspect it'll take a decade or so for the public to catch up with the change in the law, which isn't minor. It's massive rewriting. It's a massive shift of power. And so here's what occurs to me. I'll get to the punchline. The reason I mentioned the health and all policies and these other two brief notions that are required as a matter of our operational processes here to be addressed, I'm wondering if what we could do is essentially have a legislative impact analysis of development projects that find their way to the city council. And what I mean by that is not some long 20-page whatever, but what I would call a was-is report. It was like this. It now is like this. <laughs> now, at the ZA or the planning commission level, the following issues were raised by the public. Mm. So now, here's a report that says these four new state laws are implicated here because the public is interested in this piece of parking, this piece of traffic, this piece of height, this piece of whatever. And it used to work like this, and now it works like this. So that the public is being educated project by project, neighborhood by neighborhood, issue by issue as it comes up, so that elected officials and their constituents are aligned in what can be done and not done to meet their concerns on any <clears throat> particular issue. I think that might have some merit to it, and if it does, uh, and, and if that is not terribly burdensome to you, because again, I really am talking about something that's a few sentences long, not some new uh, hyper whatever uh, uh, report. I think that would be helpful for the next half decade or decade or maybe even longer. If so, when we get around to the motion is to accept and review, I would be interested if a maker of the motion would be interested in adding additional direction to uh, planning and our, and our city attorney to return uh, before the end of the fiscal year, so it give you a little while to do this, with a recommendation for what a legislative impact analysis might look like uh, and do your due diligence about what it would do uh, in terms of either additional workload or how it might uh, inform the public. Maybe it's done at an even earlier stage at the planning commission level, whatever. But you get the point is to try to have an electorate that maybe is somewhere close to as informed about this as we are so that we can do those things that are within our power but not frustrate the electorate because we can no longer do things that they knew. Something happened five years ago, you know, two blocks away. Why the heck can't I have that now? 
uh, why don't why aren't you reducing this height or whatever it might be two things one I'd be interested if there are any red flags that brings up for you uh, so let's start with that sure um, I would say uh, let's start with the first red flag which is um, bringing it back to council I don't think that's necessary I think we can just do it um, <laughs> Um, uh, we <laughs> we do um, attempt to do that oftentimes in um, our particularly in our planning commission staff reports, um, and then oftentimes that doesn't make it into the council report because um, we're we're focused often just on like the appeal considerations in that, and so I don't think it's too big of a lift um, for us to do that. We often speak to um, what the the new rules are. And so um, really what it would be is um, adding a little bit with respect to how it's different than what it was before. And so I don't think that that's um, much of a, uh, a heavy lift for us. And I think that we would be fine um, attempting to incorporate that in, particularly to the um, housing projects that come forward, because yes. that's where there's the, the yeah, most changes. Really yep. uh, so. Uh, let's stay with this for just a second because it sounds like it is unnecessary. It sounds like there's an unanimous sense that that would be a good idea or at least one to pursue. Um, I would, the way I see this anyway, is that it would actually, there would be something with a little bold type that said something there as opposed to dispersing it all over the report. Yeah. See where I'm going with that? Yep. <laughs> okay, so as long, as, long as we're good on that, uh, that's really... Uh, the comment that I wanted to make, and thank you very much for that. Uh, of course. Doesn't seem like there will be need. Uh, let me check and see if anybody's with us uh, in chambers besides Mr. Butler who would like to comment on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone online? We do. Let's go with the person online. Good afternoon and welcome to the council meeting. Yes, hello, Council Bradley Snyder again. Uh, I just, you know, I have to say that I think um, it's uh, the most uh, kind of uh, prominent or telling aspect of um, the whole circumstance situation where the state might kind of bully the city of Santa Cruz or the county into uh, cramming housing into the area. Uh, it's the fifth largest economy in the world, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of money at the state level. And, and there's a lot of interest in uh, creating, I want to say, simple options and uh, you know, a city of a city of santa cruz a city of under sixty five thousand people uh with lots and lots of uh, kind of uh, let's just say um uh, uh let's just say uh, um uh, special uh housing needs uh to try to uh intensify the uh the placement of more and more housing uh centrally located in santa cruz i i, I find it I find it suspicious that it's um, it's 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 not it's not scrutinized. I think with a little more um, care by um, uh, by by the uh, by the, uh, the local community and politicians that uh, local community, uh, you know, in an emergent way, you know, in a kind of a really uh, kind of uh, uh, confused, uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 the new district, uh, the new district elections are certainly confusing the matter even further. Uh, but, it, but I feel like, yeah, I feel like in some ways, uh, I've seen a thousand units go up in downtown Santa Cruz since I lived down there, uh, for, uh, you know, some 15 years and it's, uh, it's distressing. It's very distressing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bush. Anyone else online with their hand raised? We'll take that next person, person online. Welcome to the council meeting. Good afternoon. You know, hi, this is Garrett again. Apologize, I didn't really write anything up for this, but you know, this is the same old stuff. The, you know, when we only get two minutes now, really, what's going to happen in three minutes? Anyway, the assault on single-family housing, you know, continues. You know, and it's going to continue until a hundred percent of it is vanquished from existence altogether. That is not a good thing. There should always be some zoning, some low-density single-family property zoning for communities who can afford it. There should always be a possibility of home ownership where mostly people own their homes in small communities, which are going to be nicer communities and a, and a higher quality of life in those areas. You know, and you just want to eviscerate it. 
uh, please explain why you can't accommodate that idea of, of a, a, another, you know, single family home district of zoning that allows that. You know, I get that the nation of renters is expanding. It's hard to uh, afford a home and you need more rentals. Uh, but why everywhere it has to be eliminated as single family housing, uh, you know, I don't get it. It's an, it'll be an expensive exercise in mediocrity. Um, I would mention that, you know, condos don't necessarily mean more home ownership. I mean, you can buy a condo and rent it out. I mean, I own one, I rent it out. You know, so that's not really mean that. Um, it, it could, though. It could be a good idea. Um, uh, I would say, uh, it's, well, you know, these cities around the nation, you look around, man, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Seattle, Portland, and many other cities, you know, they're just unlivable. And, you know, it, it's... Uh, we have bigger problems, even like crime, just general societal decay. Um, you know, the, the, and when the state says, well, that we're not, if the state doesn't require some, it's probably because it's too outrageous for the state to require. And so they're saying, hey, how about you implement that instead, like those 10 unit, um, you know, whatever they are, buildings in a SFR neighborhood, uh, you know, leaving it up to you. Because I mean, you have to. Do I would lastly just say that California is losing population. This whole idea for massive housing building is currently a farce. What we need is cheaper housing. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else, Ms. Bush? No one else? Matters back before the council. Motion would be in order. I'll make a motion. Uh, Mr. Newsom, you are moving. The staff the recommendation. Yes. The recommendation is moved. There's a second by uh, Ms. Watkins. Debate Mayor. or discussion? Mayor, if I may sure. interject just real quickly. So we had a um, brief conversation about the continuation of the housing ad hoc subcommittee. It would be great to get that official confirmation that the council is interested in doing that. If you, if you don't mind adding that to the motion. Any objection? No objection? No objection. Let's make sure Ms. Bush gets this. <clears throat> Can I, if I may? Please, please. Um, you got very good. Thank you. On your motion. Or if you want to. Excuse I, me. I just wanted to say how much I appreciated you offering the legislative analysis. I think oh, those have been really helpful for me in terms of the fiscal impacts, the health and all policies implications, mm -hmm. how are we thinking broadly about our community, environmental, certainly. And as we've seen legislative changes as robust as we've seen in the recent years in terms of legislative impacts, really impacting our ability at the local level in terms of land use um, abilities. It's really important that we have that outlined and specified. And I see it throughout the agenda reports and, um, you know, for our public and for our council members, new and um, continuing, it's helpful to see it that way as well. So I wanted to make sure that was included, appreciated the um, thoughtful response on our planning um, staff and innovation by our mayor who had a great new idea that was fantastic <laughs> my goodness any more comments <laughs> Ms. I, I was um thank you because i was going to say the same thing so just briefly i think it was it was a long story but you came around in such a great way that it was it was a duh moment. Why has this not been kind of bullet pointed out before? Um, so thank you for taking the time to kind of break it down and come back around so eloquently to, um, I think that is exactly what we need to call out so that it is not such a, a confusing, as you know, one of our callers said, confusing unknown uh, hard to understand, but seeing it just bullet pointed at the bottom of staff agenda reports, um, I think is a great idea. I'm happy to support this report. Great job. Thank you for presenting us with all that information and keeping us up to date. Thank you. No further discussion. Clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Cooley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. For the business to come before this august body, Madam City Attorney.
None. For the business to come before us, seeing and hearing none, a motion to adjourn would be in order. The vice mayor moves, <laughs> and Ms. Brown seconds with great reluctance to adjourn the meeting non-debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries its so order. Thank you all very much. It really was a brilliant idea, Fred. It was. 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 It was